Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is former megachurch pastor Ryan Meeks. Hello to all of you. A few months ago, while spending time with my friend Matt Maruka, founder of Raw Optics, we were chatting about the issues of religion, consciousness, light, and the use of plant medicines for healing and exploring spiritual awareness. During that meeting, Matt said, Paul, I think you'd love meeting and talking to my friend Ryan Meeks. Ryan used to be the minister of a Christian megachurch, but he found he couldn't any longer preach the things that were not true from his own life experience. He left the church and went on his own healing path, which included plant medicines, and it really helped him heal and become whole. Immediately, I said, that's my kind of guy. I would love to talk to him. Please hook us up. As fate and fortune would have it, Ryan moved from Oregon, where his megachurch was located, to Encinitas, right here in San Diego. I invited Ryan to come to the Rainbow House to spend a day with me to explore each other's lives and living philosophies, get some exercise, and record a podcast. I was truly impressed with Ryan's story of being raised by a Christian minister, starting his own Christian church, and growing it with his wife and family support having a total membership approaching 20,000, with some services having over 7,000 people in attendance. His church was a multi-million dollar business, and he was doing very, very well, except for the nagging pains and voices within his own conscience, his own soul. In this deep, honest, highly explorative, and informative podcast, Ryan and I discuss his trials and tribulations as he left behind his security blanket, his consistent and comfortable income, and put his Bible in a safe place while he journeyed deep into consciousness and took the hero's journey. Ryan is one of the most honest, loving men I've ever met, and this dialogue is a real example of what it means to individuate, to become whole unto oneself. Ryan not only shares all the inner turmoil he went through in his process, but how his members responded as he began asking bigger questions and inspiring them to look at Bible passages with a more critical eye. One of the beautiful insights that this interview offers all of us is how essential it is to have a secure relationship with our parents. Imagine how most fathers would have reacted when you decided to tell your minister father that has been your shepherd throughout your career that you must step down because you can't teach things that don't ring true for you any longer. I know damn well what would have happened if that was my father. I think you'll all be very fascinated as you listen to Ryan share his journey, what he's learned about people himself, life, God, religion, and exploration of consciousness through the use of plant medicines. I really enjoyed spending time with Ryan, and I'm confident you will too. He's one of the most humble, beautiful, honest, loving men I've ever met, and I've had a great joy spending time with him. Enjoy Ryan Meeks as he shares what can only be called the process of heretical enlightenment. Hi, everybody. I'm absolutely pumped to tell you about one of my newest additions, my cold plunge tub made by cold plunge. This thing is so friggin' awesome. Not only is it absolutely gorgeous, a great addition to my patio deck, and it looks beautiful inside or out, unlike any other cold plunge tub I've seen out there. But one of the benefits of cold water exposure, if you get five to seven minutes around 50 degrees or even a little cooler, you will have an enhanced sex drive, and I can promise you that from the bottom of my heart. I'm almost 60. I'll be 60 this summer. And when I get out of that cold plunge tub, I still got some lead in my pencil, baby. And I got Mike here, the co-founder of Cold Plunge and inventor of the cold plunge tub, to let you know why the cold plunge is so unique. Yeah, you talked about the the beautiful acrylic tub it comes in. So that's going to last you a lifetime. Super durable and strong and looks beautiful. And another thing is the water filtration. It always filters. It uses UV and ozone and a 5 micron carbon filter. So it pulls the chlorine out of your water and just keeps it crystal clear all the time. And we also have a hot tub feature if you want to add that um at a flip of a switch, your cold plunge can turn into a hot tub, which is pretty cool. We also have uh, financing options. So it's uh, the, the price of the cold plunge is $39.90, and you can get 0% financing for six months, or you can pay $139 a month for three years. To get your cold plunge tub, go to thecoldplunge.com slash pages slash check, and use the promo code CHECK150 to get $150 off your cold plunge order. You'll love it. I dig it. Enjoy it. Hello, everybody. All of us at the Czech Institute are excited about our new golf performance specialist online training program, 
I developed the Golf Performance Specialist Program myself because there was no program in the world that offered a holistic, integrated approach to assessing the golf athlete and getting them balanced, healthy, and performing better. Through my career as a rehabilitation and performance specialist, I've worked with a long string of golfers that were injured and suffering performance plateaus that weren't getting results until I applied the integrated holistic approach I share in the Golf Performance Specialist Program, which teaches you how to customize your programs to each individual's needs. Most of them caught in the traditional mindset of trying to adjust swing faults by modifying their stance or buying new golf clubs only spent thousands of dollars that didn't help their game. But after applying the principles and practices I teach in this program, came to fully realize that it's the golf athlete that plays the game, not the club. Not only does having this specialized training give you the skills to work with some of the most commonly injured athletes and enthusiasts, it gives you access to millions of people that have the finances to afford your expertise. Regardless if you're a physician treating sports injuries, a physical therapist, chiropractor, osteopath, massage therapist, conditioning specialist, or a player that wants to optimize performance, this course teaches you key assessments and how to address common muscle imbalance syndromes, identify and activate inhibited muscles, optimize core function, and clearly shows you how to progress the player through the essential stages of flexibility, stability, strength, and power development. To order your e-learning course now, go to checkinstitute.com forward slash GPS online. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash GPS online. I know you're going to enjoy this course. It's very powerful, very holistic, and it works extremely well. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've all heard of the benefits of bone broth, but I bet you don't know about bone broth protein powder. I found an awesome bone broth protein powder with Paleo Valley, and I asked Autumn Smith if she'd explain why hers is so good from Paleo Valley. Well, like you said, collagen is basically the fountain of youth, and most of us are not getting enough of it in our diet because maybe we don't have time to simmer bones on a regular basis. And so we created our powder to make getting the benefits of collagen for your joint health, for your gut health, for your mental health, really, really simple. And we sourced it from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished bones. So it is a beef bone broth protein powder that you can literally put in everything. It's tasteless. I add it to my son's smoothies. I put it into his desserts. You can even put it in soup and get all the benefits of collagen without all of the time and energy and investment. So all you have to do to check it out is go to our website at paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15. That's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 at checkout. And I hope your family loves it. I know you'll love it. Keep your body healthy. Keep your kids healthy. And let's make the world a better place with Paleo Valley. Enjoy. Welcome to Living 4D, everybody. I'm super excited. I got Ryan Meeks here. And Ryan is a very, very interesting man. (laughs) He has a very interesting background. And I wanted to share Ryan with you today because he's been through a lot of the trials and tribulations that great percentage of the world are struggling with and trying to find their way through, and that has a lot to do with religious programming. And Ryan used to be the minister of what we would call a mega church with 20,000 members in the Seattle area, and he has a lot of experience, and he went through his own transformation so, Ryan, welcome to Living 4D. It's a pleasure to have you at the Rainbow. Welcome to the Rainbow. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. It's really kind of, I already told you, I feel like it's Disneyland for me. I'm having the best day. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, well, we got to walk the property, and unfortunately, my handyman and gardener broke his wrist this morning right yeah. before you got here, so that was a bit of shock to all of us. Um, so, we started our day off with a little sadness, but we know Freddie will yeah. get himself fixed up. So, you know, what I'd love to do, Ryan, you know, I've had a chance to hear about you and and thank you to Matt Maruka uh, for for hooking us up because when Matt Maruka saw my library and started talking to me and, you know, just he just said one day, you you really got to meet my friend Ryan Meeks. He used (laughs) to be a Christian mega pastor and he's gotten into plant medicines and he's healed all of his uh, fears and 
dogmas about God and he's really a cool guy. And I said, well, where is he? And he said, Encinitas. I said, well, shit, get us in touch. I got to talk to him, man. Anybody that's healed that, I got to hang out with because I know that's quite something to celebrate. Absolutely. So maybe you can just take us on a little biographical journey of how your life led you into being a minister of a big Christian church and, mm-hmm. and just what the experience of it was, what the challenges were, and and then what ultimately resulted in you leaving and, and going through the transformative process you've been going through. Because I think yeah. it's a, an amazing story, and I also want to hear it in more detail myself, selfishly. Yeah, great. <laughs> well, thanks for asking. Yeah, I'm as a kid, I grew up, um, my father was a mega minister himself, and so I grew up not only in the church, but I grew up um, as the son of a mega pastor in a large, and it, that was in the early 80s, you know, as I was a little kid, I was born in 1978, um, and we had moved to the Seattle area when I was young, and then they started this, what became one of the early mega churches in our nation's history. And um, cheers, by the so, way. So, yeah, hey, thanks, man. This is well, maybe my second favorite part of the whole day, right here. Yeah, well, I'm glad I can share. And while you're doing that, you know, uh, you have an interesting life correlation with one of my heroes, Carl Jung. His father was a Christian preacher as well. I did not know that. Yeah, That's surprising that I didn't mm-hmm. know. That. Yeah, <laughs> wow. One of the things that drove him nuts about the whole thing is he said that his father didn't practice the things. Monday to Saturday that he was teaching on Sunday. <laughs> oh man! Well, that's where we uh, we differ. My, I had a great experience growing up, and my father was a, a wonderful man of of integrity and certainly um, embodied much of the beautiful teachings of Jesus. He was a great dad and a present father, and and a and a man of uh, of values. So that well, was good. Critical. I mean, that means you have a secure attachment in attachment theory, yeah. at least to your dad, and and so. Mm-hmm. It's interesting for you to go through the transformation you're about to unfold uh, because most people's transformative process has a lot to do with the challenges with their mother and father, particularly quite often the father. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And certainly with my work with you know, ex-clergy these days, um, so many of them have some really hard relationship issues with their own fathers for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it was positive. And, and I actually think a lot of the the difficulty that sort of lays before us as a species right now, uh, moving away from fundamentalist ways of thinking has to do with um, the fact that religion confers so many beautiful benefits on people that when you have um, such a rich array of benefits that are conferred on you from, you know, obviously just community, you know, religion, you know, for all of its faults can really do community quite well. And so I benefited from that and have felt a lot of support and, you know, religion, especially even fundamentalist religion. um, It gives you the answers to the questions. Who are we? What is the world? Um, What shall we then do with our lives? How do we live well with one another? And so no matter how broken or narrow-minded those answers may be, uh, especially for a child, I mean, I felt like I had a grounding sense in the world. And so for me at first, it was quite positive. Uh, you're fortunate though, because my experience as a child in, in a Christian religion was that it just scared the hell out of me. Yeah. And it made me very afraid of God. In fact, in our institute in um, Sycamore, there we, we lease 6,000 square feet of our 30,000 square foot facility to a Christian church. And one day, one of my students walks up to me after having a very deep classroom session on, you know, fundamentalist beliefs and dogmas and things like that. And he says, Paul, it's kind of a paradox that you're teaching us this because have you ever looked through the upstairs window (laughs) of the church next door? And I say, no, quite frankly, I haven't because it was around the other side of the building. And so I had no reason to go around there because our side was the other side. And in huge, vibrant, flame-like letters, in all caps, it said, fear God. And yeah. I had I used to invite that pastor. I used to run debates. Mm-hmm. I'd bring in philosophers and preachers, and, and we would put topics on the table, and then we would debate them. And I ran it as a proper debate with a timer and everything so people didn't go crazy. And, yeah. and I used to invite him because I used to love unraveling his 
<laughs> Bible dogmas. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. But uh, so when, when, I, when uh, I saw this, paradoxically or, or quite serendipitously, he just happened to walk out the front door. He saw me, waved to me, and walked over and said, hey, what are you guys up to? And I said, well, I was just so impressed with this huge sign, <laughs> yeah. fear God. Yeah. And he goes, oh, yes, yeah, that's very important. And I said, yeah. what, what's that room for? Guess what that room was for? I don't know. That's the daycare center. That's oh, my God. That's where they keep all the little kids. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, that's, I've actually spent years and years studying fundamentalist Christianity. And one of the things that just drove me loopy was when I used to find these, what they called Jesus camps. Are you familiar with oh, those? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I went to some of them. Oh, my God. And they just scare the hell out of the kids, yep. you know? And I'm like, what the hell is going on? This is not how you teach someone to have a relationship with God. This mm -hmm. is exactly how you end up with a lot of neurotic behaviors, compensatory addictions, mm -hmm. fear, and people that are afraid to do anything in their life. Yeah, so, even just physical illness. Yeah, oh, of tons business. of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've spent my whole career dealing with all that, <laughs> yeah. right? And, you know, a lot of people think I'm against religion. I'm not. I'm just against the abuse of religion. Right. And and before you go on, I wanted yeah. to ask you, do you know, are you aware of what fundamentalism really actually is? Why fundamentalism was created? Well, I'm aware of like American fundamentalism, which is like, you know, evangelicalism, which is what I came from, that particular strain, mm -hmm. um, was a reaction to, you know, this, we're starting to teach uh, evolution in school. And so there's this, we got to get, we got to drill down on the fundamentals of the faith before it sort of splinters off in the face of scientific rationalism or right. whatever else. But, but please, if I can be enlightened further. Well, you're pretty close. You're, you're, you're hitting down the right path for sure. You know, someone I've studied extensively is Houston Smith. Are you familiar Absolutely, with Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So Houston Smith, uh, in one of my books by him and in some of his lectures I've seen, he describes what fundamentalism really is. Mm -hmm. And he said all the world's religions, major religions, have what is called fundamentalism because the fundamental teachings are the body of teachings that were developed by the founder of the religion because they carried the practices that were necessary to achieve what we would refer to as enlightenment or union with God or oneness, et cetera. Yeah. So the actual base of fundamentalism is really quite Positive. beautiful, yeah, absolutely. right? Like I teach fundamental principles to my students. Sure, like functional these are the movements. And yeah, you, you, these are the things you have to look at in an evaluation, or you can overlook something right. very important that's right. actually the etiology of the problem, and you'll be treating symptoms instead of the cause. Right. So the, the real reason for fundamentalism is these core practices. Mm -hmm. The problem, as you well know, is that Everyone puts their own spin on them. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is where I often quote Shankara. Are you familiar with Shankara? No. Oh, man. Write this down. Yeah. The Crest Jewel of Discrimination by Shankara. What a title. Yeah. Shankara was a philosopher sage in India who, at eight years of age, began walking all over India debating any of the gurus he could find. Hmm. And he died at 32, but he never, ever lost a debate. Wow. Although he came very close in, in his book, he outlines a debate he had with a, a um, man's wife, and mm -hmm. it was such an intense debate, he had to sit in their living room and go into meditation because she had put him in checkmate, <laughs> and he wow. asked her, please watch my body, I don't know when I'll be back, and he literally was completely gone for four days, and then he came back and cool. finished the debate, he had to go talk to God in, wow. in kind of quotes there. What a force of a woman. Yes. <laughs> and it's a very interesting discussion to read. Yeah, so it's I'll in the Crest Jewel of out. Discrimination. But Shankara makes a very important point. Hmm. And I'm making this point in regard to people teaching children stuff yeah. as the word of God or the rule of God, etc. Shankara said something profound. No man can understand scripture until he's enlightened. And when he's enlightened, he, he does not need, need scripture. I've heard that one. Okay, I didn't yeah. know that who that was. Yeah, that's Shankara. So, you know, one of the things that concerns me deeply is having studied the Bible and studied Christianity 
and many different branches of Christianity and the mm-hmm. history of it and the mysticism of it. When I see all these people coming to me with all these terrible beliefs that are causing them cancer and mm-hmm. irritable bowel syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome and mm-hmm. eczema and you name it. And then I do the analysis that I do and start looking into what their beliefs about everything from sex to money to love to relationships to business. There's all these real hard confining belief systems that often segregate them from other people, even the people they love, but worse themselves, Mm -hmm. especially women, Mm. especially the women, because Christianity is very hard on the women. Absolutely. So the point I'm making is that I get very concerned because we don't have in any of the religions that I know, Buddhism does a pretty good job of it compared to most religions, Taoism probably as well. But we don't have a system of enlightened teachers qualifying people to teach, hmm. especially to the children. And there's an old Christian saying that, that is terribly, painfully true, and I don't know the author of it, but the saying goes like this, you give me a child and I will give you back a preacher. And what they mean is that a child's mind's completely open. So leave them with me for a few years and I'll have them completely brainwashed and you can now use them as a preacher. Absolutely. Yeah. So I only wanted to share that because a lot of people, I have mentioned on other podcasts, but a lot of people don't really understand what fundamentalism is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course we have all these issues of fundamentalist Islam and terrorist attacks and, you know, how much of that is actually just manufactured, you know, silliness like we're dealing with today is hard to say but they also have these problems in islam because i've studied it quite a lot and you know where kids are forced to memorize the quran and punished if they can't recite it right you know that's that that twists me into knots having lived through that kind of fundamentalist hardcore christian science yeah stuff and being raised about uh, around a lot of Catholics, we lived in Idaho for three years, had a pig farm there, were surrounded by Catholic families. And my, as you know, from our discussions and listening to my podcast, my father was brutally violent. Right, yeah. But I'll tell you what, I used to actually get some medicine, paradoxically, when I would go to school and see some of my friends, how badly beaten up they'd gotten by their fathers and having visited them. And I found that a lot of the children in Catholic families just get the living hell beat out of them Mm. for the most ridiculous things. Mm. So coming from that background, I've just seen so much pain. And and yes, a lot of the things you say about the family values are true. It's just, you know, the analogy I give people is how much piss could I put in your beer before you wouldn't drink it? Exactly. Most people say one drop. I say, well, (laughs) The problem with a lot of the religious fundamentalist ideas is that we'll say it's beer, Mm -hmm. but when you start pissing in it with all this uh, ego-driven interpretation, and and look, here's how bad it is. My last research showed that there were 32,000 branches of Christianity all claiming to have the authentic truth. Yeah, well, I can verify that. (laughs) Okay, so if Jesus is watching all this... Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's a bit frustrated. Yeah. Right. Because this is all in his name. And everyone's camping on their own distinctives as the non negotiable, right? Yes. So the fundamentals change based on what tribe you are membership with. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mean to disrupt your flow of thought, but I, I, I just felt we should help people understand what the real function of fundamentals is. Yeah. I've never heard it phrased positively like that. And that's Yeah. It's, it's actually quite beautiful. Yeah. One of the problems, though, with with the fundamentalism is like Buddha was here a long time ago. Jesus was here a long time ago. Lao Tzu was here a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, as you know, culture evolves and the environment evolves, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody in Jesus' day had a cell phone or a a battery-powered Honda Civic or could fly anywhere on jets or had an internet or an iPhone. People didn't walk that far from home their whole lives. Right. So... You know, if the environment changes and the myth does not change, right. 
to help you interface the environment, then you right. actually now have a fundamentalism that is not functional Absolutely. or fundamental, mm -hmm. right? If we build a house, we all know that it needs a foundation. Mm -hmm. But if you're building a house in outer space, then you don't have to have the, a brick foundation. Absolutely. Because the environment's different. Mm -hmm. So if your myth is that you can't build a house without a bunch of mortar for a foundation and you're trying to build a space station, then your fundamentals are incorrect. Absolutely. Right? The environment begs for a, a shift, uh, an ev evolution, as you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that I think, is, is a real problem because a lot of the religions are still operating on principles and concepts that may have some good purchase power. Like there's... There's a lot of great fundamental principles in all the religions mm -hmm. that are fairly universally applicable, Yeah. right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We can thank Confucius for that Absolutely. one. Absolutely. I tell people, look, until we get that right, we don't need a, a, a book of like 800 pages called the Bible or yeah. the Quran or the Torah or anything, because until we get that one principle right, the rest of it's just confusing to people. It's right. too big of a manual. Mm -hmm. So I feel that we need to be really conscious of what are the fundamentals that are not only universal, but how do we apply them, right? Like, just look at this COVID environment that we're in yeah. and look at the effects of social media. Mm -hmm. People used to spend time together. So how you apply do unto others in a personal relationship has a lot more gravity to it because if you tell someone to fuck off, they might punch you in the face, <laughs> yeah. right? If you treat people yeah. abusively, there's a consequence. But now with all this social media- yeah, Keyboard warriors are all over the place. Right, so what you see is all this defaming and, and, mm -hmm. and really nasty engagement. Mm -hmm. But because there's no consequence other than someone just be defriending you or something, <laughs> then it. what I'm saying is, do you see how- because of the shift in the environment, somehow the teaching, in this case, do unto others, has to get deeper under the skin, yeah. or the ego seems to shove it aside. Right. And I think there's just a very simple example of how environment has to interface with the fundamentalism, and the fundamentalism has, and we can get into this later, has to be carried in a myth that's congruent with the events and the environment of the day. Yeah. Because if the myth is incorrect and the fundamentals are correct, it's really kind of like having a crescent wrench when you need a screwdriver. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it reminds me of the story of Jesus, which eventually becomes the uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, he's ba basically being grilled with a bunch of legal speak like, oh, love my neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor, Jesus, becomes the question. Yes. And of course, that's the ego saying, how much do I have to actually obey this teaching? You know, <laughs> yeah. How can I get around, you know, how can I cheat the game here? And of yes. course, as you're saying, that's why we need enlightened teachers yes. who can help you know, read the law or let's call it the fundamentals in yeah. a way that applies to the the scenario that we're talking about. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I've said this to you just a few minutes ago before we went on, on live, but, you know, just being with you and, and feeling you and, and you know, I haven't been shamanic with you and looked into you, but I get a very strong sense that the reason your life path has taken the changes is so that you actually can have the authentic experience of God mm. and carry that back into whatever path spirit wants to unfold for you. But mm. I can't see a guy who is a minister in a mega church um, and has those skills in today's environment mm. not wanting to reach back out and share your growth. Yeah. Because if you look back at yourself mm -hmm. 10 years ago, for example, yeah. if you could come forward and talk to the Ryan that you are right now oh gosh, and go back to the church, I bet you the price of my house <laughs> that it would change the, your whole ministry. Yeah. Well, if, if that guy could even listen to me now, you know? Yeah. Like, well, that's a good point. <laughs> I don't think he could. I really honestly think yeah, I today would scare the shit out of me 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, guaranteed. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's definitely a long process of 
of shifting, you know, in increments, you know, it has whatever to I can handle, increments. you know, yeah, whatever my consciousness could expand to include, you know, we were talking earlier about Ken Wilber. I mean, the first time I opened the book, I'm like, I'm too stupid to read this, you know, yeah. eight years later, could I finally start to slog through it a bit? So, well, you, know, you can take what you can take. Just to be fair to yourself, <laughs> I would say 90% of the human population has the experience of reading Ken Wilber and thinking, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Ken, that's true. I probably don't understand y- it now. Even You're probably talking about one of the deepest philosophers to walk this planet you know (laughs) many consider him the world's greatest philosopher right here right now i agree i got to meet him actually a couple years ago go to his house what an amazing mind yeah yes that's a very powerful mind that's someone you want teaching your kids sunday school yeah and look what he's done for the world right yeah he's basically created integral life and Mm -hmm. and uh helped human beings around the globe integrate consciousness yeah. even recently i mean the whole reason i was at his house was he was realizing he needed to reach out to that world mm-hmm. which of which at that point i was still barely even on the outside edge of but he knew like mm. I, I i have to engage this in a in a way that helps people move forward and so yes. it was great to be in a room full of ministers mm-hmm. even if they were on the outside edge of that world mm-hmm. um to have a mind like that engaging um with the most important questions was really healing yeah Well, now that we've had our beautiful segue. (laughs) I'm sure we'll have many. (laughs) Yeah, of course. I love them, right? There's no rush to to get anywhere. So we just got to kind of smell the flowers along the way. But I I would love to to have you uh, share more uh, of your journey because I find this fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, you hit on really really what I was going to say next, which is in the middle of all that beauty, right? In the middle of uh, a grounding philosophy for how to live and who we are and and, and a really uh, an ethic, right? Yes, how to yeah. live well, all that's beautiful and, and, a, and a beautiful family and loving, attentive, tender parents. Mm-hmm. There's also a larger institution that's mm-hmm. there, right? Mm-hmm. And so the truth is the the shadow side of that I did experience. And even as a young kid, being tortured by the idea that my friends that I loved were going to hell. Like I knew that. I knew mm-hmm. the truth. We are the one true religion. And if they're not, my God's going to, you know, effectively dis- disintegrate them. I mean, that was actually the the merciful one. If I believed in annihilation, mm-hmm. that particular view of hell, that they would be snuffed out. That's the merciful one. The other one is eternal conscious torment. Like mm-hmm. I don't know Purgatory. of a threat you could give anyone that's worse than eternal conscious torment of the people that you love if they don't, you know, mentally ascend to things you can't prove on Mm -hmm. the material plane so i remember as a kid as you say you know being tortured by that idea and i remember crying on the playground and i think it was second grade with a friend of mine who you know didn't believe the important things that i knew that they needed to believe and i was crying because i firmly believed this was the truth Mm -hmm. and i loved my friend and so that experience you know, that's one window into that. It, there was that part of me mm-hmm. that where I guess today I would say my soul was deeply and wounded by this idea that that this God that I was to worship uh, was really, this whole relationship was built on fear. Yes. You know, that ultimately, and you can't love what you fear no. in, the, in any meaningful sense of relating. And so yeah. it Ooh. took me a long time to realize that really there's a fundamental threat Mm-hmm. That's baked into the worldview I was handed, which is God loves you unless you don't love him back. Because in that way, he's like a junior high girlfriend who mm-hmm. will smite in your ass. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, shit about you all over the internet. <laughs> exactly. And worse. So <laughs> so I remember as I grow older, there were more and more questions that that I was uncomfortable with. But yeah. I didn't have the a strong enough individuation to mm-hmm. go back to Jung's concepts yeah. um, to stand on my own. So I yeah. would kind of you know, uh, put them away, you know, Mm -hmm. okay, like, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways, as our Mm -hmm. Bible told us. Mm -hmm. And so I would have to just say, I must be out of alignment if there's something I'm not okay with at an emotional level and put that in the background. Of course, that would come back to me later. Mm, You know, that's called building a shadow. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Putting it in the bag, right? What's the first half of life is shoving it in the bag. The second half of life is pulling it all out of the bag. So um, as I got older, you know, I had effectively learned how to compartmentalize in that way. Yeah. Like there were things that I was deeply troubled by, but who am I, right, to question God? Because I had mm-hmm. equated, of course, the institution and the teachings and any authority figures in the tradition with God. Mm-hmm. And so I'd effectively put that away and there were enough positive benefits. So eventually, just speeding through, my wife and I in 2004 moved up to the Seattle area um, after having worked at my dad's church um, for a couple of years. 
with the purpose of planting or starting from scratch a, a church community up there. Mm-hmm. And because of the connections that my dad had, I was a part of mentorships with other mega pastors from around the country. Like I was really, uh, you know, poured into and I was apprenticing with, uh, you know, sort of the leaders of that world, the evangelical church growth, mega church type of what you'd call really that spiral dynamics, that blue orange consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Right? Blue. Yeah. There's yeah. your fundamentalist right yeah. there. And then the orange where you're incorporating like this almost like business systems, uh, you know, I don't know, capitalism fused with spirituality. Well, the, the oranges are what I call the double agents. Okay. The oranges are usually the most uh, highest producers in any business, mm-hmm. but they're the most dangerous mm. because the oranges, as a, as a metaphor, let's say the orange is a tire salesman. Okay. What the orange does is they go to their people who think they're, that they, this guy's part of their tribe or yeah. woman. Okay. And he gets all the dirt on them. Mm. And says, okay, you know, I'll make you such and such a deal. Then he goes to the tire shop across the street, gets the dirt on them, and then uses the dirt on each of them to leverage the other to buy his stuff. <laughs> Uh-oh. But the the danger of an orange is that they are commonly known to leverage the owners of the businesses they work in because they're such high producers and they become so valuable, then they leverage it against that and say, if you don't give me half your business or X number of dollars, I'm going to leave you. Okay. So the paradox of the orange is that they're the highest producers typically, Uh but they're the most dangerous in any organization because they will leverage the secrets of the organization against the organization. So I call them the double agents. Okay. Interesting. What's the shadow, our golden shadow side of that? Because I can see the sinister. Well, there. what do you mean by a golden shadow? That's a <laughs> just new in one the for sense. Me. <laughs> oh, I just mean that in the sense of like what the everything has its dark and light. What's the light side of that orange in that case? Uh, highly productive. Okay, so the high producer, as you said. Yeah, okay. they're they're the go getters. Efficiency, that types of thing. Yeah, okay. if you want something done, they're the people that'll get it. Done. Okay, got it. They're the samurais of the business. Yeah, well, that that speaks well to the uh, you know the environment then because it was they were excellent at, um, you know, crowd dynamics, leadership, um, you know, building these mini empires, I guess, yes. you know, and, mm-hmm. and knowing how to leverage uh, leadership and things like that. Yes. So really good with systems, things like mm-hmm. that. And because of that, and because of course, part of it was how I'm wired, I've always been good on stage and good with people and a good communicator. And, um, you know, my Mercury is in Leo. So I tend to be like a very winsome, uh, I can bring levity even when, you know, I'm interacting with people. And so because of those skill sets and because of um, the training and the pouring in of all these other leaders that I was getting, we really were quite successful. And in the first few years, I mean, we went from, you know, no people to 20 people to 100 people, 600. In two years, we were over 2,000 and it just continued from there. And then, like you say, I mean, even at our biggest where we had eight locations across the Seattle area, um, you know, phys- there were like within our orbit, as I say, you know, there's 20,000 people who say they go to East Lake, but you know, on a, a physical moment, like an Easter Sunday, there'd be like 8,000 people. So this is a significant success for a short time, you know, span. Well, what you've just told me is that I need to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I didn't to, know I was doing that. To grow That's the great. Czech Institute. I'm here. I, I say, okay, let's put Ryan to work. He's got all these skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, it would be a, an honor to spend any more time with you, Paul. So. Well, we're, we, you know, I told you what I'm working on. So now I know who I'm going to need to help me create this new movement I'm working on. <laughs> So yeah, I mean that's where it, it it took off, and I think there was a a significant milestone when we hit about three thousand, and we were in a facility. Finally, we had been renting schools, and we had seventy thousand square feet, and we were really that's blowing it going. And yeah, it was a large facility, and I ha- finally had a staff. And you know this as an entrepreneur when when I finally had people to do the the busy work, the stuff that yeah. I mean, early on I was driving the big semi trucks, and I was playing the music, and I was teaching the messages and I was organizing everything. By the time we were that size, you know, 3000 in this warehouse, I finally had time Mm. to think. I was going to say, how did you avoid burning out completely? Yeah, well, we'll get to when I got cancer, I'm sure, at some point yeah, in the podcast. Yeah, I'm waiting. And I, I, also, <laughs> I was very unhealthy. I have another question. Yeah. I'm waiting for the right moment okay. to ask. All right. Well, hit me with it when you're ready. Yeah. So it, at once I had a staff, 
I could actually sit down and think, well, what do I want to say? Because beforehand, I mean, I had playbooks and one pastor gave me a, a zip drive of like every sermon he'd preached for 35 years. And he's Jeez. like, just use my outlines. You're too, you guys are growing way too fast for you to be in the study all week. Yeah. Like you got to develop leaders, you got to develop systems, which yeah. is true. Yeah. Um, but once I had time to sit down and think for myself, all that shadow, you know, as you say, I was putting all the questions away. And yeah. once I was like, what's authentic for me? Uh, instead of just like playing other people's songs, uh, it started to unravel for me. And I would say around 2009 and 10, uh, not only with the extra time I had to think, but international travel working with global relief organizations because of the influence that we had. Mm -hmm. I'm interacting with, you know, Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims mm, and atheists. God. And yes, absolutely beautiful thank people oh who my, God, yes. my loving relationship with these people confronted my worldview. What am I going to do with the truth, quote unquote, that these people need to become my religion or they're in grave danger to put it lightly? And so. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, if you're listening to them, you're going, wow, they got a better philosophy than I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I remember being in, in India and at this, this, the humble home of this beautiful Hindu family. And I'm sitting next to this altar, which of course, in that framework back then for me, I was like, ooh, satanic, you know, there's an idol on the, yeah. on the furniture. And thinking though, and I remember having this, sense like the spirit of whatever i'm calling christ mm -hmm. is here mm -hmm. and i had no idea what to do with that mm -hmm. i was like oh shit because i could feel the fact that i was on the level of identity fused with these ideas that were crumbling mm -hmm. one of the metaphors i use sometimes is the sandcastle that was my faith mm -hmm. i wasn't stomping on it right the the tide of was experience just, yeah. and relationship was washing it away and i was laying in front of it trying to stop yeah. the inevitable you know absolute vanishing of this and i wept over it eventually you know after oh, yeah. it's a uh, lot you know i i read the bible twice through in one year i'd done it before but in one year i read it twice through thinking there's something wrong with my faith i got to rescue it by reading the bible all the way through and i did it twice and it got worse by each yeah, <laughs> my you misgivings. Had, you had more time to revisit the questions exactly. that were plaguing you, and so. But the the difficulty here, and I think this is when my my health journey really began, uh, and it began, of course, by getting much more unhealthy. Was I realized I was becoming more and more out of alignment. So yeah. privately, here I am in this high powered position where many people would think I'd done it. I had book deals being slid across the table at me, invitations to teach at these big conferences, plenty of finances and and power mm -hmm. uh, and praise, right? Oh, you're the greatest, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Inside, I'm going, I don't believe this. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I do? One, will my wife stay in relationship with me? What does that mean in regards to my four children? Mm -hmm. um, am I going to be divorced and see my kids sometimes? Am I going to lose my whole community? Like I didn't want this all to evaporate. So for a number of years, I figured out a way to, I guess, play gymnastics in my head that, mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I'm the dysfunction. I will figure this out at some point. One day we'll call this the dark night of the soul that I went through. Mm -hmm. And then we'll all celebrate that mm -hmm. my faith was restored and I'll write a book and I'll get, I'll have even more power and influence by the way you are clearly describing someone <laughs> at the orange values meme <laughs> well here you go like see, i said you see the double agent yeah, absolutely i remember feeling as a double agent in union psychology what you're describing is disharmony between what jung calls the inner ego and the outer ego mm -hmm, or the mm -hmm. soul and the persona absolutely in aboriginal speak they say when a man's mind and body do not stand in the same place he's crooked mm -hmm. so they're saying whenever who you're presenting yourself as mm -hmm. is incongruent with who you know yourself to be on the inside you're in trouble yeah and and that's how you get a disease absolutely and it manifested and i mean i was so incredibly unhealthy i was drinking lots of alcohol at night to to, to power down mm -hmm. i mean the church was growing incredibly rapidly yeah and so just even handling, you know, 50 staff people or whatever else oh, yes. was so much wear on my body while at the same time, internally, I'm like, I can't even, I, I'm not, I'm too afraid to bring before my partner, the person I love most in the world, the truth that, hey, I don't believe this stuff anymore. Mm. I know it's core to how we've built a life, how we understand yeah. our own relationship, yeah. what we're teaching our children. And so thankfully, eventually, without going into all, the whole story, um, 
we had incredible heart to hearts. It was hard for her at first, but when she, she knows my heart, I'm not mm. a vindictive, you know, baby eating atheist as mm. they would have trained me to think of atheists back then in the yeah. old days, right? <laughs> I was, I wanted to do right by her and I wanted to be devoted to her and, and to help her shine in the world. And so she trusted that enough because mm -hmm. of our good relationship that she opened to the same questions. And of course, by doing so, by being willing to say, like, what about the way we view the world is broken? Mm -hmm. And um, she was much faster than I was at assimilating that we're wrong about some things. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to read a million books to finally intellectualize my way mm -hmm. into, okay, we're wrong here. You had your own Mary. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank God I, for uh, Mary. And she's the greatest gift of my life. But um, basically, it, come, it came to a point where, you know, we're in these multiple locations. I'm recording these videos, these, these sermons on Thursdays, and they're going out on Sundays. And thankfully, that gave me enough of a like a, a spaciousness from the church itself mm -hmm. where I was almost, I could kind of mail in my product and then I was working through this existential crisis. But eventually it was so big that I realized I have to start saying this stuff. I, had, I have to start teaching that we're wrong. And the way that we hold this book, the way that we hold this really this library that we call the Bible is not only incorrect, it's dangerous. And mm. so I started to slow, my original plan, Paul, <laughs> was, this is very naive, was I was just gonna slow drip it in. Just just kind of slowly poison them with the good news mm. that we're wrong mm. and that we don't have to convert people to this right religion. In fact, so much of the ways that we have this orientation towards this fear-based view of God or absolute reality, we can be free of that. And so mm. I started to use the teachings of Jesus to show like, even how Jesus would teach, like the way you view God is broken, mm -hmm. you know, and that everybody's in on the good news and that kind of thing. And people were starting to pay attention, like, what are you really saying? And they could kind of sense it. But about, you know, once I started going through sections of scripture and showing like this, where it quotes God is saying, kill your brother mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff, this is morally bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And anybody who treats the Bible this way I mean, we're arming this mm -hmm. for violence and destruction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when people started to get started leaving by the hundreds. Oh. And then, you know, people are sending me angry emails. But the Niagara Falls was when we made a public statement of affirmation of the LGBT community. And Time Magazine did an article on us as being, you know, one of the largest evangelical churches in America that's, um, you know, saying, hey, we're open and affirming as it relates to, you know, different people's ways of orienting themselves sexually and gender identity. That's when, I mean, the hate mail came in and people were leaving faster than you could count them at that point. You're lucky nobody burned your house down. Yeah, well, I, d I got death threats for sure. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, Steiner had his first institute burned down. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Gary Lockman's book talked about that. But so, yeah, I think that was, it was an important part of the journey because it, it assassinated my ego in a way that I had to wonder who, you know, who I am I and, and what really matters because after being fed, so much praise, so much power. Mm -hmm. You're the greatest, you know, all this kind of stuff. I had to let all that die and have it be really publicly, not only humiliating, but just painful. People who said they loved me one day were cursing me as the devil himself the next. And Well, you know, I'd say a couple of things. One, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Two, Joseph Campbell would say the day you got honest, you went on the true hero's journey. I believe that. Before that, you were staying in the nest of a metaphorical womb of mommy, daddy type protection. Yeah. But Joseph Campbell says, entering the hero's journey is not going into the forest and looking for somebody else's trail. Yeah. The hero's journey doesn't begin until you carve your own path mm -hmm. through the forest and you've got to meet the dragon and slay it. Yeah. And so that's when your true growth really begins is when you... I believe it. And, and, and it, look, uh, you're sitting with a guy who's been... <laughs> yeah, every kind of attack you can imagine. I know that's true for yeah, sure. I know. remember you quoting one time. I think it was I. I don't know who said it, but I think you said this is Rumi that in order to know God, you must first become a heretic. Yes, that, yep. To get when to I God, heard you, you say that, yes, when I heard you say that, I was like, oh, I mean, that was that was my experience. I realized through a lot of this what we've called like deconstruction. This sort of mm -hmm. not only of self but of a concept of reality and God. Um, that I actually never really had a, what I would have called back then a relationship with God. I had a, a fear 
Yeah. Basically, I was playing insurance. Yes. Like, here's the threat. Yeah. What are the chances that this is mm-hmm. true? Well, because of the magnitude of the threat, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be that high of a percentage, right? That's how you do insurance, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, well, what's 25 bucks a month? If, if if my house burns down, then I'm covered. Right. And a lot of people treat fundamentalist religion like that. They don't yeah. believe necessarily- no. But they're playing a game of insurance. Like, yes. well, if there's a chance I could go to hell, then I'm going to just, you know, do the thing. I'm going right. to go to church and pretend to give a shit and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, here's one of the only reasons that that concept actually works. Hmm. And then I'm going to ask you the question. Okay. One of the only reasons that concept works is because in the Abrahamic religions, with the exception of the mystic branches of them, yeah. God is somewhere else right we're fallen we're over here right to get to god you got to go to the church the preacher the pastor Mm -hmm. etc right you can't get to god directly which is one of the greatest business strategies the christian church you know by the way research in brainwashing shows the catholic church had brainwashing mastered by the 8th century a.d and have been perfecting it ever since (laughs) so the point i'm making is if you were to Take somebody, for example, that was raised in the study of Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism. Their sense of God is that God's everywhere. Yeah. And God is in and as all things. Right. So you see the differences is that you can play these insurance policy games and juggling, as you've described in your head, and manage these two personas. Yeah. Because... The concept is that God's out there somewhere. Totally. But to someone that lives like I do, you know, God's closer to you than your breath. I mean, if you want to meet God, I tell people just go stand in front of the mirror and hello. (laughs) Ask yourself what it took to create a human being Mm -hmm. or to create the world or a universe. And most people won't ask those questions honestly. Right. And part of the reason is, is because they've been educated or miseducated through scientific materialism to think that this all just happens all by itself. That we all evolved out of a chemical soup, even though the chances of that are about as good as throwing a hand grenade in a print shop and having a Bible jump out the back. But when, when a person's relationship, and Ken Wilber talks about the first, second, and third person relationship with God, and most people's relationship are second and third. They're not first person. Yeah. But when, when, when God is within you, yeah. then the, you can't keep anything from God. And I think if people realized that the word God means source and sum, mm-hmm. source and sum mm-hmm. means wherever everything comes from is God and the totality of everything is to God and there's nowhere to go but God and there is nothing but God, which is why I signed your book with the first principle of Sufism, <laughs> yeah. which is there is no God but God. I worship everything and everyone. Now, to me, that's religion. Mm-hmm. That's real religion, mm-hmm. right? Now, interestingly, there is no God but God. I worship everything and everyone. Put that right up against Confucius's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. One, the Sufi principle is saying everything is God, Mm -hmm. including yourself. So be aware Mm -hmm. that you don't need to look for God. You're walking on it. You're talking to it. You're eating it. You're sleeping with it. And you might even be appointing a gun at it. Just be careful. Right. And do unto others as you would have do unto you basically takes the God issue out of it, but says, Essentially, whatever you're doing to that person is probably going to come back at you, which goes hand in hand with the Hindu concept of karma. Absolutely. So you see, I I say to my patients and my students and people like that, look, all you got to do is ask yourself, if God is God, is it possible for God to be somewhere that you're not? Mm Mm-hmm. Or you don't understand what God is. Mm -hmm. Then you have really got a deeper rift. Because now you have an imaginary God. Right. But you can see why it's effective because the experience of being human for so many people Mm -hmm. is to have an inherent understanding that um, there's this felt sense of separation. And so, you know, we were talking about it earlier, this idea of an I thou is just baked into healthy development of an Mm -hmm. ego. And so 
fundamentalist religion, at least what I grew up in, it plays off of that. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you know how you kind of fuck up sometimes? Yeah. That's because you're terrible. You know what I mean? And so it, we all have this sense. <laughs> Thanks for reminding yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we all have a sense that like, man, I can't, I can't make myself into the person I want to be. And that's a normal part of, you know, most people's experience. But you walk into a church and it's saying, it's just echoing that back at you, but then put laying this belief system on top. Yeah, it's because you're a dirty wretch. You know, you're a dirty sinner and you're separated from God. So it's pushing on this felt experience of separation in a way. But guess what? Not only do we have the problem, but we've got a cure to sell you, which oh, is yes. this manufacturing of a problem now that I have a product to sell you. But I have to rewind the tape on that. Yeah, yeah. That very felt experience that you're talking about is programmed into the child. Absolutely. Because a Buddhist child would not have that. Right. A Taoist child would not have that. An atheist child would not have that because they wouldn't even have that concept in their head. Right. They're, they're, and, but yet, but yet, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Scientific materialism already, without a needing theistic being in the sky judging us, yeah. it because it sees the world as a, just this big clock or whatever, this mm-hmm. this soulless accident. Yeah, there's an inherent separation there because there can be. everything is separate from me, and I'm an accident on yeah. here, and the, we've moved the locus of meaning from the an ensouled universe. Only the only place where we allow for any meaning in a scientific materialistic universe is within the self and it's manufactured. Well, there can be because because of what you just said, but I've met atheists who I think are in a much better position than most anyone yes. in the Abrahamic oh, religions. And I because could agree. and I've I, I've like I said, I debate people like this and I talk to them and I don't debate them to make them wrong. I debate them to say uh, my philosophy is any belief worth living is worth challenging. Mm-hmm. And that's why I purposely started to make groups. a good Jew in that kind of <clears throat> Well, you know, I got a little <laughs> of everything in me, you know. <clears throat> I'm a fool. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the tarot sense. But I've met atheists and agnostics, because an agnostic just says, I don't know. An yeah. atheist just says there is no God. Right. Right. My wife, Penny, is an agnostic. As much as I talk about God and study God and paint God, you know, yeah. Uh, she's says I just don't have enough evidence to make that decision. Yeah. You know, I'm you know, I'm pr- paraphrasing her. She's like I'm happy that you have your experiences in your relationship, but yeah. I don't have enough evidence to convince me either way and she says quite frankly I don't need it. Yeah. There's life is rich enough for me as it is. I yeah. don't need to go beating the bookstore down or chasing some preacher to try to answer the question for me. Yeah. So I think that's a very, very healthy I disposition. Agree. I, can, I can identify with it myself. I mean, I, I told you earlier, I long for the kind of conviction and certitude that I feel in your presence. And of course, I've listened to you so many times on the podcast. Well, I, yeah. And, and I can tell you how that came about at some <laughs> point, uh, you know, either in the conversation or whatever. But But the point I'm driving at here is I've met atheists who actually have such a sense of marvel Hmm. of the fact that all of this created in their model Hmm. by chance, Mm -hmm. and that is magic to them, Mm -hmm. and their sense of God is nature. Mm -hmm. Their sense of God is the majesty of the universe, the fact that the sun keeps us warm, Mm -hmm. the seasons, the harmony. Mm -hmm. and I can tell you as a therapist, if a person comes to me with that disposition, it's rarely ever their belief system that's the cause of their illness. It's almost always just ignorance of not knowing how toxic foods are or that they're burning themselves out or just not knowing how to care for a human body. Yeah, that makes sense to me. It's it's still a way of holding reality as sacred. Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And and, and so the thing is, they just don't call it God, but because their orientation is based on what they can see, which is something material, yeah. a physical universe, yeah. so solids, liquids, gases, and plasma, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, what they learn in science class, then that's where their orientation is. And the magic is in the mystery of the marriage of those elements yes. and what it produces. And so it takes a fair bit of depth and time and maturity for a person to start questioning, well, how did those elements get mixed? Yeah. Right. So you you know, you grew into bigger questions. You started off as a child mm-hmm. in a Christian family, mm-hmm. being indoctrinated, 
But then you grew into the deeper questions that ultimately triggered your hero's journey. Yeah. So some people don't evolve. You know, I think I've heard Ken Wilber say most people won't evolve one structure stage in their entire lifetime hmm. of consciousness. So one level. So fundamentalism, which would be traditional to modern, mm -hmm. would be one structure stage. Modern to postmodern would be a structure stage. Postmodern to integral would be a structure stage. Mm -hmm. um, most people won't evolve one level. And in and, and relationships, it's really dangerous because I tell my students, if you get one chakra level development ahead of your partner, the relationship can be completely destabilized. Mm. So my metaphor is, if you cannot hold somebody's hand as you evolve, you're losing them. Mm. And that means if I'm, if I'm at the fourth chakra because I've found real love, but you're at the third, if I don't hold your hand... And I get too mystical or too far away because someone at the third level is I oriented, mm -hmm. my way, my dream, my goals, third yeah. chakra orientation. Then what happens is they actually feel like they don't know who you are anymore and they yeah. don't feel they can follow you. It's almost as though you're speaking another language. Sure. And you can, of course, as you grow, you start developing new relationships and your partner may find these people odd or yeah too fluffy or sure. well especially third fourth because isn't, yeah. that, isn't that power and control and then well thir third chakra is really who uh it's it's who am i personal power and self-will so okay, it's all personal power. self agency okay. so individuation happens at the third chakra mm, okay. you you have to grow through the third to individuate first chakra is the first seven years of your life mm -hmm. second seven years so first is I have to listen to my parents because otherwise the wolves can eat me. Yeah. So you're totally at the mercy of your parents. Second is, well, oh boy, I've got pubic hair growing and breasts or whatever, yeah. and and I've got all these weird feelings. And yeah. so what is what is my orientation sexually? Uh -huh. Am I happy with it? Uh -huh. And how do I use my creative energy? Because the second chakra is all about libido, mm -hmm. eros, mm -hmm. eros, and all yeah, that life energy, eros and, and agape, but. So yes, it's life force energy. And, and so the second chakra is when a child starts to really get a sense of what path interests them, where a young man says, I'm going to be a fireman when I grow up, or, okay. yeah. or I'm going to be a flight attendant, or I'm going to be a pilot, or I'm going to own a, a beauty parlor, or I'm going to sell beautiful clothes. Mm -hmm. So there you start to see the child's creative life force energy is starting to bubble up mm -hmm. and to see how can it interface in the world and do something that feels magical to it. And the mm -hmm. third is, okay, how do I make that journey? How do I separate myself from my family, become an individual, pay my own bills, gotcha. take responsibility for my actions and suffer the consequences of my own choices without yeah. mommy and daddy being rescued, uh, yeah. being the rescuers all the time. And then the fourth chakra is <laughs> coming to the realization that love is the ultimate um love is the ultimate uh glue that holds everything together from your relationship with yourself to other people to the world mm -hmm. and and up we go from there i think it's interesting that you chose the third and fourth for that example because i don't know if you agree with this but it's just occurring to me that that's probably a lot of people get stuck in relational difficulty, particularly between oh, three yes, and four. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Wow. Because that's the, the the third chakra, the first three chakras are chakras of I. Mm -hmm. The fourth is the chakra of we. Yeah. And the fifth, sixth, and seventh are how do you integrate with that, which is transcendent. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Right? So yeah. I, we, all. Mm -hmm. um, because, for example, if you're a teacher or a minister, <laughs> first you have to be confident in yourself, mm -hmm. then you have to share with others, and where you're getting the information shouldn't be from a book, it should be from a transcendent source. Experience, this yeah. is why um, <laughs> enlightened people don't need scripture, yeah. right? Because their scriptures are direct connection to spirit itself. Right. And that's why I would say I didn't really start my spiritual journey until I started to ask those harder questions, because... Yeah. 
to be honest, what I used to call my beliefs, when I really got down to it, I was like, oh, these aren't beliefs. These are agreements. Uh huh. I made agreements with other people's ideas. Yes. I memorized other people's mm-hmm. transcendent experiences, yes. supposedly. Uh huh. And then I was taught how to interpret other people's transcendent experiences. Right. And then you get to this place where, you know, years later I do, you know, NNDMT or something. And I'm like, oh, and now I've had an experience with transcendence. I had no idea. I had, I, I never knew God, you know, yeah. in a sen- in a conscious way. Right. And 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 on that matter, and then I'm going to ask you this question. Yeah. This is something important to kind of ponder. Hmm. You had an experience of transcendence. Mm-hmm. Came by way of a molecule we'll mm-hmm. call. Dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Yeah. yeah. But what a lot of people don't understand, and I hope that you do mm-hmm. or can now, is that one of the reasons people keep going back and back and back and back to do psychedelic drugs mm-hmm. is because they only feel connected to God when they're on the drug. Right. But the point I want to share with you and everyone listening is. The drug is not showing you something that it's doing. It's lifting the veil of what's happening all the time. Absolutely. Meaning that what you're experiencing is actually more of the truth of who you really are. Mm -hmm. You get the point? I do. Transcendent sounds like you're getting somewhere else, right? right? It's a little self-congratulatory, right? (laughs) Well, that's okay. I don't mind that. But what I'm saying is like... If someone says, well, I have to transcend this place, it usually means you got to leave it. You got to get out of here, right? I got to transcend the second grade to get to the third grade. Okay. But what I'm saying is third grade is already in you as a potential. Fourth grade, all the way to the top. So we're just waking up to the truth of ourselves. It's not as though it's somewhere you've got to get to, mm-hmm. right? As Buddha says, we're all Buddhas. We just often aren't awake to that yet. Mm-hmm. So the proper use of plant medicines is not because the drug is a magic ticket to a transcendental location or experience that mm-hmm. you can't get to without it. Right. That leads to the idea that you got to keep doing drugs in order to experience God. Right. But what I do my very best to do is to say whatever you experience in the ceremony, it's important to remember, particularly the more stunning, beautiful, amazing, and awe-striking it is, or numinous it is, to remember that you're actually encountering the rest of yourself, that your ego has been a filtration system like blinds on the window that block the sunlight. Yes. So the medicine just pulls the lampshade up, but the sun's always been there. Yeah. Right? It's just been waiting for you to come out of the house. Yeah. You're just clearing the distortion in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one of the most important things for people to realize is that a transcendental experience is really a transcendental uh it's transcending your own programmed limitations. Mm-hmm. The message is to realize whatever you experienced is with you all the time, and it's the higher truth of reality that oftentimes, you know, as Terence McKenna says, you can sweep the monastery floor for seven years or you can do one hit of DMT. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> and like for those of you who don't get that, it means you can go to church and meditate and pray and clean the floor and be a good little nun or monk. Yeah. And maybe if you're lucky in seven years, you'll have a transcendental, transcendental experience through prayer or through chanting or, you know, a function, yeah. which they can all do. But for most people, the baggage is too heavy to blow out with a chant, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but for most. Or you can do a hit of D&T and figure out who you are in the count of one, two, three, God, Mm -hmm. right? So the the real take home that I try to get people to say, remember, what you just experienced is something that you want to live. Absolutely. The medicine is not doing it to you it's showing you who you really are by lifting the lampshades and cleaning the windows so you can look out and go my god the world is so beautiful yes right and look what happens to people locked in their houses in covid scared to death scared to touch anybody right it's the opposite of a transcendental experience Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I won't go too far into that. Just no, because that's I don't beautiful. Wanna... I'm glad you said that. That's a really important distinction. It is. We it's... don't need to take this to get there, but rather, in, in, in at least in my case, it gave me more hope for the spiritual journey in the sense that, oh, this is the capacity. Like, this is what's in me. Therefore, keep going because yeah. the idea is to cultivate this as a way of being in the world, mm-hmm. not to be like, hey, when I want a vacation from this dimension, let me go take the God you know, uh, train and go right. visit God somewhere else. That's, that's good. That's what integration is for. Yeah. And that's where people run into trouble. If they do plant medicines and they don't have someone skilled teaching them how to integrate, mm. then it's kind of like having wild sex with somebody else's wife (laughs) and having simultaneous orgasms and falling in love with her, but not realizing she she's having fun with you. She doesn't want to leave and run away with you. (laughs) So now you've got yourself in a real problem because if she's the only girl that can take you there, you have to keep sneaking into her house at night and risk getting shot when her husband (laughs) finds you. Right. But what I'm trying to teach people is, The function of plant medicines Mm -hmm. is to teach you how to get there. Mm -hmm. Because once your nervous system's had the experience, the brain pathways are open, the new neural pathways are open. Research shows that literally within seconds of being exposed to a new idea, new neural networks are growing. Mm -hmm. So the secret is to say, okay, what was the experience that you had? Oh, I had this oneness with God. Mm -hmm. What did it look like? What did it sound like? What did it feel like? Mm -hmm. And I draw this information out because I'm painting a picture Mm -hmm. and I'm letting them paint the picture. And then I say, now, tomorrow, when you sit in meditation, go back there Mm -hmm. because it's right in you. You now have the key to the door to that dimension because you know what it looks like. You know what it feels like. You know what it smells like. You know what the color of it is. You know what the vibration of it is. And guess what? It's always there. Yeah. You just have to turn the key and go there. And that requires that you not be lazy, mm-hmm. right? You actually have to do the work to sit there. And people say, well, I try and I try and I can't stop thinking. Good. What you just said is you have very heavy window shades. Mm-hmm. So maybe what you ought to do is just say, hey, today I'm going to just work on taking the pain off the window shade. And if my head goes crazy, I'm going to sit and watch and say, look at it. Isn't that amazing? I have this real resistance to heaven. I have this real resistance to bliss. I have a tremendous resistance to freedom. The problem is, unless you're going to breathe DMT all day long, you're always going to still end up with the lampshades on. Yeah. Right? So the trials and tribulations of learning to witness your mind and not attaching yourself to it, that's the cleaning of the window. That's what the Sufis call polishing the heart. That's the real work. The experience of realizing maybe you're too judgmental or that you could love somebody better or love yourself better because the medicines, as you know, will teach you that very clearly, then you got to go do it. Mm -hmm. But I've had countless people say to me, oh, Paul, I did this journey and I realized I don't love my wife enough or whatever. And then I can't seem to stop doing what I've always been doing. And I say, good, now you know what spirituality is. It's the practice of being aware of that and doing something about it and remembering that if you're just 1% better today than you were yesterday, 100 days from now, everybody's going to be really impressed with your growth. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of Houston Smith, who you talked about earlier. It's mm-hmm. his, I think it's his quote, the challenge is to transform flashes of illumination into abiding light. Exactly. And to take that right back to where I've been trying to go here, the abiding light is abiding. Mm-hmm. You get it? Mm-hmm. Abiding. Yes, to abide here. means to be present. Mm-hmm. I am here. God is always abiding. In mm-hmm. fact, Plotinus says the three qual- qualities of the soul are to represent, to reflect, and to abide. Mm-hmm. So the soul represents itself. Here's Ryan. This is the Ryan of God. Mm-hmm. It represents. It reflects. Ryan says, am I really teaching the truth in church? Because if I'm being eaten up by these questions and they don't make sense to me, then how can I really trust that I'm taking people 
somewhere other than my own angst. Mm. Because if wow, I'm yeah. leading the bus, they have to end up where I'm going. Mm. Wow. Because I'm the captain of the ship. <laughs> so there's reflection. And that's what meditation's for. Mm -hmm. And to abide means guess what? God is way woo way. Action without action. Doing non-doing. And that's the paradox that the intellectual mind cannot grapple with. Yeah. Oh, man, for sure. Right? So the real beauty is realizing that the three qualities of the soul are the three qualities of God. Mm -hmm. God wow. represents itself as all that is. God reflects on itself within you. <laughs> wow. And God abides. And all of it is a dream. And that's why it's called Maya. Because if God is unconditional love, mathematically, that's a zero. Something that's no thing is simultaneously everything. And zero has no need for a physical location because it's everywhere and nowhere, which is abiding. Wow. So there's nowhere to go to get to God. Thank you for that. I'm it's, so glad. Whatever I whatever I did to poke the bear to get that to come out of you, I'm I'm pumped about well, it. Well, you know, I'm, <laughs> I just share my love because I I watch everything that concerns you, yeah, and everything that led you to leaving that ministry, yeah, is everything that I see in patients with diseases mm -hmm. and people that are lost, confused, and neurotic and narcissistic, yeah. And all of that, you know, Jung says neurotic behavior and narcissism are both compensations. And they're compensations for something that is in conflict within us that we cannot reconcile. So here's the big question I wrote down. Okay. How did your dad handle all of this? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Great question. Um. Well, I the short headline would be uh, remarkably well. Um, <laughs> That's a real good daddy there. Yeah. I want to yeah. meet your dad. I got to give him a hug. He's a wonderful man. Um, so part of that is it was slow, mm -hmm. like in the sense of over a few years, I was integrating more and more of my own, you know, my own reality. Like, okay, I can't, as you say, I can't keep splitting. I can't keep playing both sides. Mm -hmm. And the more I got into alignment uh, over time, he was only having to digest a bit of my shift at a time. Right. <clears throat> but I remember sitting in, I had a little tree house for my boys in the backyard at our house. And uh -huh. I, I sat him in the tree house one night and I told him, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be public about this. It's coming out in Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go well. I'll probably be unemployed. Like an evangelical megachurch will not survive this. You know, I know, but I'm going <laughs> to, I need to do this because in my view, if I had just resigned and left it, there'd be another entity out there that I started. Yeah. That was telling people they're sinful, yeah. that they're going to go to hell, whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is my problem that mm -hmm. I created. Mm -hmm. And I either need to, like a rabid dog, I either need to put my dog down, mm -hmm. right? Or heal it. Yeah. But it's, it's, I don't get to just leave this like bomb, you know, out there mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So I told him this and he, and I said, do you think I'm crazy? Like, am I leading people astray? Like, am I a dangerous person in the world? That kind of stuff. This is where I'm at. And he thought about it. He was quiet for a little bit. He looked off into the distance and then he turned to me and he said, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I know your heart and you're a good person and none of this will benefit you at all. So I trust you. Like, I think you're making yeah, the right decision. It's, that's a wise papa. Absolutely. And and yeah. he's always chosen relationship and love over, um, you know, needing to be right about any sort of dogma. And so I really because love Because what him. your father was saying is what you're about to do is going to be so painful to you. The fact that you're doing it means it has to be medicine. Mm -hmm. It can, no, you know, unless you're a psychopath that wants to cut and mutilate themselves. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't. I don't even like a little bit of pain. So it yeah. was definitely. So he did well. And you now it's been harder for him as things have moved on. I mean, back then I was just talking about, you know, probably being a radical, liberal, progressive, mystical Christian. Mm -hmm. But when I got to a place where I think we talked about this earlier, not on the podcast, but you know, once I left fundamentalism, I got stuck in the ditch of, of you know, atheistic scientific materialism and mm -hmm. sort of a nihilistic, That's I don't a know, malaise. <laughs> it was. 
I thought I was liberated, and then I'm like, oh shit, this is kind of worse. See, there's no God there. It's a despairing, like horrible. There's you know. not even a God to be afraid of. Totally. There. I didn't even have a sacred way you, to hold the world. You can pray to the God you're afraid of and yeah. hope for some rescue, but <laughs> exactly. when you're a exactly. scientific materialist, all yeah. you got to do, what do you do? Go to your chemistry teacher? Exactly. <laughs> Say, what, how do I figure this out? <laughs> I mean, what's the worst part about being an atheist is you nobody to talk to when you're having an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good <laughs> so that stage was harder for him yes like when i was like i don't believe in god now since that time he's aware that i you know um my experiences with depth psychology and like i talked to you about bill plot and nature-based you know yeah. wholeness practices and then psychedelics r- like blew open the doors on all that i was you know that was over immediately i was like okay source mystery whatever we want to call it the everything seed i don't care a zero point energy yeah. field is a reality yeah. and i bow before it whatever it is i didn't need yeah. to screw down on the terminology right yeah and uh, so i think that even that's made it easier for him as i've sort of moved back into a sacred worldview yeah uh, i've got a question for you are yeah. you familiar with matthew fox oh yeah yeah good because you know he got excommunicated from yeah. the church for talking about buddhism and taoism totally and... matthew was a huge part of my journey oh Absolutely. yeah his writings and uh yeah i love people matthew of his fox Ill. man i've read several of his books and listened to as many interviews as I can with him. <laughs> yeah, him and Thomas Berry yeah. and uh, yeah. Brian Swim and some of these people. Yeah, Brian Swim's com- a great cosmologist. Yeah, I love his work. Cosmologist. Yeah, that, I mean, so many of the people at CIIS for sure were a huge yeah. part of just, you know, transpersonal psychology and any sort of like a sacred way of telling the universe story helped open the door little by little again. So I could trust, you know, in some ways it was like having my heart broken. Yes. I didn't want to leave Jesus. I didn't want to divorce God. I felt like I lost that. I lost the inability to do it. Like I lost the ability to play GI Joe's when I was in seventh grade. I was yeah. like, oh shit, this used to be fun, you know? And yeah. So I grieved it. Yeah. And then to fall into, okay, I don't believe anything and try to be like, how do I live well now? To believe again, yeah. to trust mystery again was yeah. kind of like, oh, I'm scared to open my heart, you know? And so that was a little bit of a journey. You know whose story is very parallel to yours in many ways is Thomas Merton. Oh, yeah. Seven Story Mountain blew right, my mind. Right. Yeah. In his <laughs> love affair with the, was she a nurse or a cleaning yeah, lady or something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah young girl who was married. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just bringing it on back, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> Yeah, for, for sure. And you know how his battle with the bishop and yeah. trying to get out of the he had to go be alone in the woods so Absolutely. he could write. And, and then they him. sent him back after because he's like, Oh, I'm gonna be a Buddhist. They're like, No, you get out of here, you gotta go back and be a Christian. This is yeah. your role. It took him like twenty years to finally let for him to get a little cottage in the woods on yeah. their property, but I I loved reading all the back and forth letters yeah. between him and the bishop. Oh it was God. like this guy was trying to keep him in a tight box. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, and anybody with that kind of influence, you know, you got to silence the <laughs> the dissonant voice in there because yeah, they're going to create the, trouble. Silence the truth teller, the tale, the truth teller, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and we know where Jesus got. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason he got crucified. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Hi, everybody. You know, people from around the world are constantly asking me where they can find organic foods and supplements that are actually organic, not just some fake impersonation, which is sadly so common in the marketplace today. My most common suggestion is go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, where you can find a wide range of excellent nutritious products made from certified organic source materials. Organifi has superfood drinks that actually taste great, (laughs) unlike most, immune support products, excellent high-quality protein powders, digestive support, joint support, liver support, green juice, hormonal support, and menstrual ease nutrition formulated by a team of female herbologists for women and more. My family and I and a significant number of my clients and friends and students from around the world use and love Organifi products because they're nutritious, taste great, And unlike many products, you actually get what you pay for. Hallelujah. I love Organifi's high values and high quality products, and they're excellent for athletes, children, and the whole family. There's no better investment than investing in your own health and well-being. And when it comes to investing in my health and the health of my family, I go to Organifi. 
If that's not enough to make you want to explore all the amazing products waiting for you at Organifi, I'd love to sweeten the deal for you by offering you a special Living 4D with Paul Check discount of 20% on any of Organifi's excellent certified organic, super clean, nutritious products by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 on checkout. That's CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. I hope you enjoy Organifi as much as my family and I do. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk. Until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combined them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it? And what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffaria, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. Well, Ryan, um, I'm totally digging this whole <laughs> Me too. unraveling of your story because it's not only beautiful but it's just downright truthful. Hmm. It's it's everything you're sharing is exactly why I teach what I teach. Hmm. Cause you're about the ten thousandth person <laughs> that I've engaged with these kinds of complexities. Yeah. And 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 I will also say it this is not unique to Christianity. I, yes, I see this course. heavy in the Muslim community. I see it heavy in the Jewish community. Um, and I've also seen it in the Buddhist community. I've seen it um, in the Sikh community. I've seen uh, many of these same challenges in Hinduism. It's different in Hinduism. Usually the big problem in Hinduism is that the parents, similar to these other religions, the parents have a really hard time when their children grow up and don't want to attend ritual ceremonies because they're very ritualistic there. Mm -hmm. And they don't, maybe they're Shivites and the person gets into Tantra and wants to, you know, maybe become more aligned with Shakti or another deity. So they deify their deities and that becomes just like Christians have their Jesus and Muslims have Muhammad, etc. 
you get the same problems of of retarded individuation mm-hmm. and that's really the one of the main issues is is and what i mean for those of you that aren't familiar with the union concept of individuation i mean that the family wants to keep the now adult in the position of a child which means that mom and dad regulate what your beliefs are when you're there or not there at such and such a gathering ceremony and often who you can marry especially oh, yeah, you know sure. like uh, without going into a long story i've had some very painful cases of people whose parents downright would not let them marry the person they love mm-hmm. and said if you do that you're going to disgrace our family you're going to we're going to burn in hell because of you oh yeah uh, yeah wow. i i i've I, I, if I had more time, I would go into some of these cases because they're so shocking and heartbreaking. Mm. But the point being is that when a person individuates, they become whole unto themselves. That's what individuation means, to yeah. become a whole person, to make your own decisions, mm. to take stock of what mom and dad gave you that works for you. It's tangible in the world and it's worth repeating and what parts you need to um, love them enough to let them continue to live because that's their choice, but they just yeah. don't work for you anymore. Yeah. And so, you know, the story of Christ going off into the desert is an individuation story. Absolutely. And so your story of leaving the church is going into the desert. Mm-hmm. That's the story of meeting the devil within yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And who did you meet in there? Every time you went in there and said, mm, I don't have a, I don't know if I can buy into that. So then you see, okay, now I'm toying with the devil. He's taken me off the path, right? <laughs> totally. And so there you have this this challenge. Yeah. And and you know that really lends itself to something I'd like to explore with you. And you know when I look at at the whole issue of COVID and the Great Reset, what I see is that the grand majority of the world population is actually believing what they see on television and on their phones and on so-called social media as though it is the inspired word of God, like people believe in the Bible, but they're not questioning it. They're not saying, okay, what do other experts equally qualified with different opinions have to say? Right. Because that's, the importance of diversity, not only in nature, but in mind. And that's the danger when you start having a cancel culture that starts removing freedom of speech, because now you're doing the same thing as monocropping, which kills nature. Nature depends on diversity, but so does a healthy mind. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And what what a lot of these cancel culture people, all of them don't get, they think they're protecting each other from exposure to these things. But what they don't really comprehend, and I can summarize it like this, you see, with freedom of speech, if somebody's, a, uh, let's say, a skinhead or a, 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 a Nazist, you know, and they're really angry at, say, the black people, and they say, well, we're going to, you know, on the social media, we're going to burn these people, we're going to kill them. Well, it's out in the open. Now everybody knows, okay, we've got to watch these people because they're making threats that if carried out, are very, very detrimental to a lot of people. Mm. And But as soon as you start canceling those people, now you have no warning system. Mm. You see the point I'm making? Mm. If, if people are wearing their dirty laundry on the air, and we say, oh, look, there's the dirty laundry. I, I feel sorry for that guy. Or, wow, that's a strange and interesting way to look at life. Or, wow, I never thought of it that way because you can have just as much ahas as you can oh my God moments. But once you start canceling people and you start, um, you know, once you start taking away freedom of speech, you start taking away some of the greatest minds in the world who have very enlightening observations and experiences to share that could tip the scale on whether or not you get an injection or a vaccination, whether or not you uh, you, you might have once thought, for example, wearing masks is really helping you. But then when you start studying the scientific research on that, you go, wait a minute, this is hardcore science. And it goes completely against what the so-called scientists and doctors are saying. Mm. So then you become an adult. 
That's what individuation is. Now you have to actually use your own mind and make a legitimate decision. And the decision is only either going to facilitate greater freedom or it's going to bind you, right? And, and that's what it means to take responsibility for your choices. So I'm curious with all the growth that you've been through with the programming you've worked out of and the understanding of, of how people get caught in these belief systems, what do you see when you're looking out at the world right now? Yeah, great, great question. Well, it certainly concerns me. I mean, uh, not only the methods that are used right now to um, get people to comply with yeah. the government, you know, it's funny. I, I feel weird sometimes having to remind people that we've been duped by our government to believe in any number of things over mm -hmm. so many years, whether it's to bait us into Vietnam or whatever, whatever else. Yeah. And so uh, it's funny. I'm actually surprised and partially impressed with the innovation to use a health scare yeah. as a way to control people and to basically, you know, um, annihilate some of our rights. So yeah. this is, it's deeply concerning to me. Um, but the environment was ripe for it be, as we sort of retreat into these binaries where, you know, you're either a Nazi or, you know, Jesus Christ, you yeah. know, you know, or vice versa, yeah, you know, whichever yeah. side is like, it's, it's all or this or, yeah. yeah. And that kind of thinking is, of course, really scary yeah. because nobody's really all this side or all that side, but they're the only way in, to paint. They're informed or uninformed. Yeah. That's what right? it boils down to. And, and usually informed means agree with everything I think. Or, yes. And I should clarify that. Usually it's not even what I think. It's what my group that I've given away my power to. Yes. They think. Yes. And so we have this magisterium of, of, uh, priests now. Mm -hmm. They're not priests anymore. They're, uh, well, I guess they are in the function of priests. Yes. But it's for a ism. Yes. And an ideology. And that is deeply concerning. And what they're using is actually what religion has used for a long time. Yeah. Fear and shame. Yes, absolutely. So if we can't keep you afraid of the virus, yeah. then we'll shame you for not complying. Because and you're, you're murdering everyone because yes. you're not wearing yeah. that kind of thing. I mean, we've done this with religion for so long. Yeah. So anyone who's not a student of the way that religions, institutions, governments have used this kind of um, tactic to yeah. control the populace. I mean, you're, we're just going to fall into, you know, playing into the hands of power grabbing. And that's deeply concerning. And even, you know, to uh, come off of what you said about silencing, or I remember when, and first of all, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, but when I saw that they had turned off his Twitter, the first thing I thought of was, I hope everyone can see who's really in charge now. Mm-hmm. Because yes. No government. That's my next point. Okay. Yeah. So, like, all of a sudden, you can just silence the president of yes. the United States yep. as a private, uh, you know, com for profit company. I'm like, okay, good. Now, naively, I'm thinking people will immediately see, oh, here are our overlords. Yes. You know and I mean? that's, <laughs> that's the deeper problem. Yeah. Because people think the government's wanting us to do this and that. But when you follow the money, Mm -hmm. And you follow who's pulling the strings and who's controlling the media, you get back to just a handful of billionaires like Bill Gates and a few other guys that have somehow managed to create uh, puppets out of major organizations such as governments, yeah. World Health, CDC. And really, this is why the, the religious statement, money is the root of all evil, is actually dangerously true. Yeah, for sure. The love of money, for sure. And just that being, of course, greed. But um, yeah, I mean, it's deeply concerning to me. And I think that the issue that we're going to have to grapple with is a at a deeply personal level, our willingness to retreat into and under authority. Yes. So it's easy to point at, oh, them, they're the sheep and they're the whatever. But as soon as we decide it doesn't apply to me, we're already in trouble because this is just a human propensity to out of fear. You know, nobody likes to, as Terrence McKenna says, live without conclusion. Mm -hmm. So because not knowing is so terrifying to lower levels of consciousness, yes. if that's okay to say it that way, mm -hmm. um, we give our power away. Eric Hoffer in The True Believer talks about this. You know, the idea that if, if 
nothing's really going on inside here, well, then I'll give away my power to somebody who seems like they know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's how we get these you know, horrible leaders who do horrible things on the earth because you have all these people who have all abdicated their power and their own intuition yeah. and their own minds. And common to, sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, so, and then everything gets politicized. So yeah. it, you know, if, I, if I'm, let's say, Republican or Democrat, whatever it is, I have to take the whole kit and caboodle. So I have to believe all of these talking points in order to do that. Yes. And there's, you know, I think it's Jung who talks about there's safety in the group. Yes, so we yeah. retreat or we sort of um, infantilize, if that's a word. Yes, it is. Yeah. Our minds <clears throat> to go back under mommy and daddy's authority, yeah. which mm -hmm. is, of course, the authority of the structure and the institution. So that's deeply concerning. And, and I would mm -hmm. say the other thing that concerns me um, is <laughs> the fact that we can't talk about health and then ignore the health implications of isolation. Right. And masks. And, you know, <clears throat> the, the other issue is this is a new vaccine that's an RNA-based vaccine, which means that once you have the vaccine, you are never the same person again. You now have something reproducing itself in your own genes and some of the very skilled experts I've heard talking about this with great concern are saying, do you realize that you have no idea where this is going to go? We really are playing complete and utter Russian roulette with yeah. this. I think part of it too, like layer and layer, further layer deep, is this deep fear of death. Mm -hmm. Like we have this obsession with staying alive forever and not facing death. And, yeah. and so anything, like even just viruses in general, we've decided that viruses are bad. Yes. And so there, and I'm, certainly I'm not qualified to necessarily go on a long diatribe about the biology of it, but to approach something that we've lived in a balance of harmony with forever, forever. <laughs> yeah, on the earth in such a way as this is the evil thing we've got to get rid of it is, of course part and parcel of a culture that has decided that we need to subdue the earth to use the religious language. And so our, our, the way that we're relating to our own ecosystem is, and obviously destroying the earth is now relating to the way that we're dealing with our, you know, the, this health crisis, whatever you want to call it, which is uh, also a crisis of thinking independently. <laughs> and, you know, paradoxically, what's happening is we are basically experiencing a combination of scientific materialism, this causes that, so we use this drug or this injection to stop that, mm -hmm. and religious fundamentalism don't question authority. Totally. Yeah. So when you mix religious fundamentalism, which means you have a bunch of adults with child minds that can't think for themselves and don't investigate for themselves and don't ask bigger questions, mm -hmm. that's the, the lack of individuation. And that's also a product of our education system, which teaches people what to think, not, not how, how to, to think. think. Absolutely. Right? And so then you have the scientific materialism, which is all based on causality. Mm -hmm. You know, if you push this domino, it'll knock those over. It happens every time. If you space them just right, it's a guarantee. Mm -hmm. And then you couple that with people's fear of death. Which is really a fear. It's, it's, you know, as Zig Ziglar says, most people's fears are false evidence appearing real. And what mm. is the internet? It's where you make false evidence appear yeah. real. Oh my gosh. You yeah. can make your boobs bigger. You can make your dick longer. You can yeah. make your smile white. You can, yeah. you know, all this is just, you know, ma make believe, right? Yeah. right. But when a, when, when a whole culture loses touch with reality mm -hmm. and they don't know the difference between Hollywood and the real world, well, this is what you get. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the deeper concern for me is, okay, well, you don't need to be a genius to say, where did our government go? <laughs> you don't need a I used to be in the 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper who is an elite soldier trained to jump into enemy territory in the heat of battle to protect the United States of America, and all soldiers and police officers swear on an oath to defend the United States from enemies foreign and domestic. Okay, so what concerns me deeply is our military is falling for this, hmm. and they're not seeing that we have terrorists that are domestic hmm. 
And every country now has this going on. So you have to say, who is it that's got enough money to manipulate governments worldwide, to manipulate media worldwide, and to convince people that they're going to die and that they're a threat to everybody else? When I say, like you said, if you simply look at the taxonomic tree of life, and you follow it backwards, you get to three things, viruses, bacteria, and fungi, which turn out to be our parents. People forget that somewhere between 50 and 90% of all the cells in a human body are actually not human. They're viruses, bacteria, Mm -hmm. and fungi, and parasitic organisms. But you're so used to looking at it in the mirror and calling it yourself, you don't realize it. (laughs) So, you know, what I'm saying is somehow... The power players have made people afraid of what they already are. Mm -hmm. And does that mean that there's not things that, yes, we've had plagues, but when you study those plagues, one of the things you see, okay, the Indians got wiped out because white man came and brought diseases their immune systems have never seen before. So it took them cycles of generations to develop herd immunity. You, 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 yes, we've had these various plagues, but when you actually really look into, okay, what causes that? The greatest minds I can find always show that it has something to do with the imbalance in the environment. Hmm. We are doing something in the environment. Hmm. So it's either communicable because it's something that people from somewhere else have brought in so your immune system doesn't know what to do with, or it's a byproduct of how we're um, damaging the environment. Yeah. And, you know, Steiner goes into this quite a bit. Um, Various experts do. And my point isn't to go rehash the whole thing of COVID. My point is really to say, when we look at what you've just shared about your journey through Mm -hmm. fundamentalism, which is a belief system, Mm -hmm. which most people, if they're honest with themselves, are in the same kind of conflict that you're in because human beings are fairly intelligent creatures. So how do you sit in a church, for example, and hear that God is love and God will also burn you in hell for a very long time because you touched your genitals or whatever? When anybody that has any degree of common sense would say, well, if God is God, then God is the source of everything, that ultimately that means God burns God in hell, which to me is very concerning because it makes for a very unintelligent God. Yeah. Well, that's the problem with fear is it, if you're already dealing with fear, you know, you know this well and could probably articulate it better than I, but when people are in fear, they're not thinking well. So no. the kind of complexity and discernment that's required mm-hmm. for deeper thinking uh, you need to be out of fear, <laughs> yeah. Because the bandwidth of you know what you can do and think through, even just your emotional bandwidth, when you're in fear, narrows. Yeah. And so the problem, you know, dealing with you know, let's talk about my background. People in fundamentalist religion, they may not be able to defend logically or in a debate ridiculous beliefs, but because they don't have the bandwidth, because they're like. The sort of the the headline is, if I don't believe these things, I'm going to hell. So they cannot even afford to open their minds to consider a discerning, thoughtful process about what about the what about my beliefs actually correlates to reality. They can't get there because it's like trying to do long division with a machine gun on your head. Yeah, you're not going to do that great a math when you're you know terrified. And so when people are scared, it's easier to believe ridiculous things. Well. <sighs> Here's what I have to say about that. (laughs) That's the herd mentality for sure. But in my life, and I've been scared plenty of times, Mm. my first reaction is who do I know that's been through this Mm. and has made it out the other side? And if I don't know someone, I start doing whatever research I've got to find. Yeah. When I, as a therapist, if I come across a disease and none of the doctors around me have engaged it before, if I can't find in the literature, then I start searching. I start asking doctors, do you know of another doctor? Do you, and I keep going until I find a wise man or a wise right. woman. And then I sit at the feet of that person and say, tell me what you know about this. And if what they say to me doesn't make sense, 
then maybe I say, okay, who do you know that also, where'd you get this information? And I track it. Inevitably, what I find out is that their interpretation of that is uniquely their own. Mm -hmm. But when I start looking at the other sources, I find that there's actually other aspects to it. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that's what elders are for in a tribe. Absolutely. And we have lost that in this We've culture. lost it. Yeah. Right. And, and that's a big, big concern. Yeah. You it's know, no surprise that an adolescent culture is easy to control. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and this is one of the reasons that, you know, there's so much money spent to pacify people with video games and movies yeah. and yeah. junk food. Bread and circus. Because it keeps them at a low level of consciousness. And, and, you know, Jung and Steiner both talked about the fact that consciousness has a real weight to it, right? Steiner said most people's diseases are the product of consciousness. And, and that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But, you know, I say the devil you know is always better than the devil you don't know. So, for example, before you were conscious of the inadequacies or discrepancies of what was being taught as the word of God, the chaos was still inside of you. You just weren't conscious of it, right? A person doesn't have to comprehend a threat or a confusion for it to affect them. Yeah, you so understand what I, I mean? I absolutely that? believe that, yeah. Right. When you become conscious that there is another way to look at something, mm -hmm. when you become conscious that there are other religions have ways of explaining God or philosophies for relationship mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, the use of plant medicines, for example. For example, in some sects of Buddhism, it's absolutely frowned on, and their interpretation is that Buddha is completely against it. In other sects of Buddhism... They say not too much, not too little, and if it helps you grow spiritually, then it's effective, right? right? I'll give you a, a, another example of how consciousness works. Let's say you're in a committed marriage like you are. Mm -hmm. If you've been believing for the last X number of years that your wife loves you and that you're committed to each other, but then you find out she's been having a extramarital affair for the last five years, you were unconscious of it for those five years. When you become conscious of it, you could develop a stomach ulcer. Mm. You could develop uh, irritable bowel syndrome. You could develop headaches. You could develop uh, um, anginus pectora and have the symptoms of a heart attack, but it won't be because you actually have something wrong with your heart. It's because all the emotions trapped in your heart and it's leading your physical body to manifest an expression of the emotional entanglement that you have. Right. So you see, once you become conscious of it, now your whole body responds because you're aware. Right. But then if you sat still and said, okay, if I want to really be honest, how many times in the last five years have I smelled something odd going on, but just didn't <laughs> yeah. want to look at it yeah. for fear that it might cause a disconnection right. to my partner. Yeah. Usually when people look back, they go, okay, the breadcrumbs were right there and I just did not want to follow the trail sure. because it was easier just to pretend that would never happen, right. which is called blind faith, mm -hmm. right? So Steiner and Jung both say that Consciousness is actually the source of most people's disease because when they become conscious of something, if they can't manage it or don't choose to manage it, then the awareness of it grows in them until it eats them alive. Right. Uh, Jung, Jung said whenever he was working with patients that had real challenges, he always asked them, what is your unmet task? Hmm. What is it that you've known you've needed to do? Be it quit your job, change professions, get wow, a divorce. That's powerful. Yeah. What is your unmet task? Steiner said whenever you're dealing with a person that has a disease, the most important thing you can do to help them heal is identify their secret story. Hmm. Right? So what's the secret story? My wife would never have an affair. What's the truth? She's been having one for five years. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. What's the uh 
secret story. My government would never deceive me. My yeah. medical system would never inject me with something that wasn't really well scientifically researched. Right. And they would never give me something that was as dangerous as what it's trying to protect me against. Mm -hmm. What's the truth? Well, shit, about now, there's probably about 300 documentaries loaded with medical doctors whose own children developed diseases, autism, shortly after having some kind of vaccination or medical intervention. And only then did they start doing the research to become conscious and I've seen several interviews with medical doctors that were just utterly heartbroken and furious and disgusted with the fact that they had been duped, mm -hmm. tricked, brainwashed, and that they didn't ask bigger questions. Mm -hmm. They just went with the party line. Mm -hmm. And what a painful way to individuate. Absolutely. But in many ways, you know, for a lot of people, the only way, like they weren't going to change without that kind of, right. what, I, what I think, you know, Father Thomas Keating calls the spiritual journey, a series of humiliations. Yes. And I think that is so true. And, and uh, uh, paradoxically, when the devil shows up with his pitchfork, which I call the pain teacher, mm -hmm. what we usually call the devil is usually the wake up call that we've avoided. Mm -hmm. Right. For sure. And so- if we look at this from, <clears throat> from a union perspective and say, what's our collectively unmet task? Mm -hmm. It's growing up. Oh, yeah. It's learning to think for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's doing our own research. It's asking bigger questions. It's being honest with the evidence mm -hmm. and saying, okay, this is the evidence. Now, you can get into a situation where the evidence weighs out about even on either side. But we all know that as adults, we have to make choices. You, you go buy a new car. You go to a Toyota, Toyota dealership. And they say, our best car is actually the Lexus. Mm -hmm. So you go to the Lexus dealership. And they say, this is a better car than a Mercedes. Then you go to a Mercedes dealership. And they say, this is a better car than a Lexus. And here's, wh here's why. <laughs> yeah. And they put all the facts on the table. And you put them on the scale. And you say, shit, they balance out. Mm -hmm. Except... The Mercedes costs more money, and it's been around a longer time. And then maybe they have a racial bias. Uh, I'd rather go with a German car than a Japanese car. And then they buy their Mercedes, and the next thing you know, it's in the shop all the time, and their friend with a Lexus is giggling and says, hey, you should have bought a Lexus, I told you. <laughs> yeah. And later, they realize that a Lexus is actually a car that was made by Toyota deconstructing 30 Mercedes Benzes under the command of make every part of it better and cheaper. And that's actually how Alexis yeah. came to be. Yeah. Right. But the point is once you make the decision, you're committed. That's what it means to be an adult, mm -hmm. right? Once you ejaculate inside a woman's vagina, you've made a decision, <laughs> Yeah. right? And how many men run and leave the woman all by herself and, and shit like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because that's not accepting your adult responsibility for a penis. Mm -hmm. And it leads to lots of trouble. Yeah. It's a lot so, of growing up and that's a need here in this culture. What is sure. our unmet task? It is to grow up. Mm -hmm. It is to stop letting everyone else govern our lives when we have to be in charge of our lives. It means to Take ownership of your body, not just keep selling your problems to doctors and therapists. Just pay attention to how you're living, mm -hmm. right? You don't get obese overnight. It takes years of work. <laughs> you don't get yeah. cancer overnight. You got to work at that one too. Yeah. So you keep putting pimple cream on your face, but you don't notice. Every time I eat ice cream and potato chips, I get tons of pimples. So I need more cream. Yeah. Not less chips and donuts, more cream, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, th th that's not taking responsibility for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so then if you say, okay, Steiner says, what is your secret story? What is our secret story? I'll ask you, what is the secret story that the majority of the world population is telling itself as we go through this great opportunity for individuation? That you're going to die from COVID? That's or, one. Yeah. Is it true? <laughs> no. Not unless you're already sick anyhow, <laughs> yeah. and then any, or an a, a mosquito or, or bite's going to kill yeah. you, yeah. Yeah, right? Exactly. So Humpty Dumpty's just right on the edge of the wall, then anything yeah. will give you the great fall. What are we going to do? You know, if you look at the statistics, 
car accidents are more common yeah. and deaths from car accidents, cigarette smoke. We could put a list of yeah. like 40 things that are far more dangerous and occurring every day. No one's doing a damn thing yeah. about it. Yeah, nobody's worried about diabetes. You it know, wasn't like just 10 years ago. I found solid scientific research showing 68,000 people a year were dying from trans fatty acid consumption. Wow. 38,000 people a year died from AIDS. They made a huge stink out of that, but no one said a damn thing about the poison they were putting in everybody's food. That yeah. somehow just got swept under the rug. Yeah, and there's back to follow the money, right? Yes. It's like Robin Williams saying that we got to have senators that like wear their sponsors like NASCAR on their foreheads. Absolutely. Like, this is who buys me, you know? Yes. And, and, and it goes back to, you know, following the money. Absolutely. You know, so when when we say, okay, what's the secret story? I can tell you, what my version of the secret story is for humanity is as a therapist with 37 years of experience mm. who has studied this and lived it, mm. the secret story that our culture largely has is I want somebody else to take care of me. Oh, yeah. I sure. want someone to feed me, to clothe me, to give me a job, to protect me, and I want to do as little as possible. Yeah. And this is what happens. When, because that's a highly profitable group of people, mm -hmm. highly profitable. J. Paul Getty said, far better is it to get 1% from 100 men than 100% from one man. Hmm. Why? Because like a mosquito, you can extract the life out of them slowly. Hmm. And you can get 1%, but if you do that 7 billion times, that turns out to be a lot of money. Absolutely. The problem is, is these mosquitoes are just drilling in deeper and deeper and 1% is turning into 10% to 15%. And, you know, you know, a good example of this was when Donald Trump gave the $2 trillion relief uh, fund. Hmm. People were just dancing in the street. I go, why are you so happy? You actually think that Donald Trump reached into a secret <laughs> bank account and pulled $2 trillion yeah. out and just passed cookies out? Yeah. Watch what happens to your taxes. Yeah. You're going to be paying that money back with great interest. Mm -hmm. Largely because you don't have enough creativity to reinvent yourself and say, okay, let's figure out what we can do now. Yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger gave a lecture and showed that 75, he, he quoted research showing that 75% of Europeans hate their job and 70% of Americans hate their job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh well, shit, now is a great time to say, how fucking Lilia, <laughs> my restaurant shut down, I can't make enough money, what do I want to do? I want to become an artist, a massage therapist, I want to go back to university. Yeah. But look what's happened, our education system has killed our creativity. Hmm. Our education system was built by plantation owners to teach us not to be creative, to follow rules and do exactly what we were told when we were told or else. So we have a corporate-based education system that's designed to tell you what to do and not how to think creatively and not to think for yourself. And I can tell you, my God, the number of people that I've had as students with advanced degrees that don't understand the fundamental basics of oh, the yeah. very things they've got degrees in and look at me and say, how do you know this stuff? And I ask them, how is it that you don't? Yeah. You've got a degree in kinesiology. You got a degree in biomechanics. You got a degree in theology. You you got a degree in philosophy. And you guys act like you don't have any education at all. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not criticizing the people. I'm saying this is the problem that we have collectively. Why? Because we want somebody else to make it easy for us. Most degrees are really just certificates of attendance yeah and memorization yeah <laughs> most most uh religions are um memberships in a club mm -hmm. they're not really the true path of spiritual growth and development or mm -hmm. yeah well ken wilbur talks about the two levels right the first level of religion is basically bolstering the ego yeah the second level is making it toast <laughs> <laughs> absolutely destroying it you know what i mean so people get stuck at first tier which is like you know uh, we're gonna go and we're gonna do the rituals and we're gonna be the you know good ship morality all aboard the good ship morality and we're gonna make sure the kids don't you know do drugs until they move out of the house or whatever and yeah. so we're just like anything to keep you know things moving along smoothly whereas the deeper levels of what we would probably call good religion or healthy religion 
are about absolutely dismantling the part of you that's willing to go along with whatever authority tells you to do. Right. right? You know, so the, the, the thing that, that's deeply concerning to me is, is that everything about your story is a story about what the American and the world culture is going through. You, you see my point? Sure, yeah, for sure. We're going through a rite of passage, a yeah. much needed rite of passage. Agreed. So for me, I, I actually paradoxically celebrate this whole thing. I do too. Because if we don't have a rite of passage, we are going to die of infantilism, infantilism, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're destroying nature. We are yeah. not taking responsibility for the destruction that we're inflicting on the planet. Yeah. We are addicted to instant gratification. We are distracted by drugs, by television, mm -hmm. and very few people are actually living a life that gives them a sense of meaning, value, and purpose, which is one of the reasons we have so much depression, so much suicide, so much anxiety, because people don't know why they're here or what they're doing. Their jobs aren't satisfying. Their relationships are often not satisfying. A rite of passage teaches you how to face the greatest fear you have, death, mm -hmm. and know that you can transcend it if you're in the hands of wise elders who set up the initiation. Yeah, absolutely. But this initiation's not being set up for us to transcend it. It's being set up to keep us in Sunday school mm -hmm. and in order and profitable. Mm -hmm. And that my friends, is how a revolution gets started. Mm -hmm. That is how a great divide gets started. Mm -hmm. And that is how civil wars get started. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if we don't get back to fundamentals, what fundamentals am I talking about? Guess what? I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what if you're a scientific materialist, an atheist, no matter what way you live or think, mm -hmm. all of these things depend on healthy soil, mm -hmm. clean a, water. a clean water, a food supply that's not more poisonous and dangerous <laughs> than nature is designed to be, yep. clean air, respect for nature and the great chain of being from the microorganisms up, which means yep. we got to stop pumping money into chemical manufacturers and tricksters, mm -hmm. we actually have to take part in caring for and protecting the planet. In my opinion, we need to get all the lines off the map. All of those are arbitrary lines yeah. drawn by human beings that have led to many wars and mass destruction. Absolutely. Yep. We, we need to realize right now we're all one big family. We need each other. And we need each other's cuisine, we need each other's music, we need each other's creative genius, we need each mm -hmm. other's art, we need each other's gardening skills, yep. we need each other's scientific prowess, we need each other's viewpoints, mm. and we need to sit around the campfire and say, what is the fastest, most efficient way to bring this planet into harmony mm -hmm. before we run out of resources and all go through a much more intense rite of passage that leads to c complete and utter starvation. Yep. We need to learn to think the way nature works. Because yes. Because you cannot continue to live out of right relationship to the laws of reality. You know, we used to use the laws of God. Well, and people still do. You know, the laws of God. You can't violate God's laws. Well, if you want to use that word, fine. But you can't live out of uh, right relationship to the laws of reality any more than I could run through this brick wall right now. I mean, I could right. try. The, the wall is not going to punish me, no. but the reality is it's going to hurt. And we can't continue to outstrip a finite resource base and not eventually die in our own excrement. Any living, cyst any living yeah. organism that outstrips its resource base suffocates in its own excrement. Yes. And this is the path we're on. So yeah. We have to look to nature to teach us how to live as part of nature. And I think she's got a lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Considering we got here one second ago and it's a 4.5 billion year experiment in immortality in the at aggregate. At least on this planet. Yeah. It could be. Uh, Who knows? Uh, uh, an infinite experience yeah. in the universe because, you know, many cosmologies now we have a uh, 
universe concept, a multiverse concept, and an omniverse concept, all of which are backed by science, science and scientists with very crafty mathematics, yeah. and people like Nassim Harriman and many people that are the smartest people walking the planet are all saying, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> our conception of the vastness of the universe could be dangerously small based yeah. on current science. But that's going to take humility, and we are a long ways from humility. Well, here's, you know, I wrote something down where you said that hmm. God's laws. Let me tell you a little bit about God's laws. God okay. has only one law, hmm. and that is that God is unconditional love. Hmm. Now, let me tell you, that sounds fluffy, <laughs> but if you want to run into that wall, the answer is yes. If you want to marry somebody you're not in love with because your parents told you to, the hmm. answer is yes. If you want to take a vaccination that has not been scientifically researched or ethically researched or even morally evaluated mm -hmm. and pushed through a system by people with lots of power that nobody else has been ever to do, able to do, I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. You couldn't buy that. <laughs> no. You and I couldn't gather enough money in, in, or enough tea in China to tip <laughs> that system. But a, yeah. uh, uh, somehow Bill Gates seems to be able to just push a few buttons yeah. and a few others. Okay. <laughs> the point am I making? God, as unconditional love, cannot say no, because to say no is to create a condition, which mm -hmm. means, by definition, God becomes that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is no source potential to give us all the diversity of opinion, the diversity of universes, stars, and planets, and everything that is. Mm -hmm. This is why I tell people, be careful what you wish for, mm -hmm. because every thought is a prayer. You get it? Absolutely. This is why I say fear makes a very bad seeing eye dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Right? If God is love and God is the source of all and the highest form of love is unconditional love, then the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. You want to kill yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. You want to live in love? Let's do that. I love that. Mm -hmm. You want to commit suicide? I've done it lots of times, but if you want to do it, I'll do it with you. God is so loving, God will do anything with any of us, mm. even be Hitler, even be Charlie Manson. That is unconditional love, but that is also total freedom. Mm -hmm. And as Osho says, freedom is the most dangerous thing you'll ever experience. Because as soon as you start displaying freedom, other people resent you and they want to kill you and they'll nail you to a tree called a cross mm -hmm. or whatever way they can get you, burn you, torture you, and look at the history of mystics telling the truth about yeah. God. Wow, no kidding. And, and so there's the danger of freedom. Mm -hmm. To be free means to be honest, mm -hmm. even when it's dangerous. And you'll have to individuate first. And you got to individuate first or you get to do it in the fire. Mm-hmm. But the reality of it is, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to take a shot, yes. If you want to be controlled, yes. If you want to stand up and say, wait a minute, I'm an adult. I don't need you to tell me how to live. I can take responsibility for myself. The answer is yes. If you, you know, look, if I'm a rational man, if I really thought there was a viral epidemic that was a real threat the first thing i would do is study it intensively because i've got fucking children mm -hmm. and i got two wives and i've got a life that i'm still living and mm -hmm. and and i'm interested in finishing what i came here to do i've still got enough love in me to stay here mm -hmm. so if someone starts talking about something like covid trust me i did about 300 hours of research into this and the deeper i went the bigger the rat smell got, the mm -hmm. more stink I ran into, mm -hmm. and the more manipulation, greed, and lying, and trickery I ran into. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? This is the worst trick. The only thing that I've ever seen that parallels this is the Second World War. Well, you can see how why the dynamic of an adolescent culture would have such a hard time with that idea, even mm -hmm. considering it. So if you think about child psychology, a child that is dealing with a parent who is uh, unable to appropriately meet needs, or let's say is even abusive, let's just say it that way. Yeah. It's too psychologically traumatizing to place the problem on the parent. So what happens? You know, this is a therapist. The child says, it's me. 
Yes. I'm the problem. They, they right. internalize it. It could, it could because they can't handle the trauma of thinking the person who's charged with my care is broken. So when you have an adolescent culture, it says, well, the government can't be doing something that would hurt me right. because the psychological trauma of me realizing that I need to grow up right now yes. is so heavy yeah. that anybody say, that crazy Paul checks out there saying, hey, maybe I shouldn't inject myself means I'm going to have to deal with and, and actually assimilate the idea that my parent that I've been looking to to take care of me, like you said, is unfit. Well, I'll tell you what I'm really saying in case someone thinks I'm saying they shouldn't inject themselves. Yeah. I'm saying something a lot deeper than that. Okay. The answer is always yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Good Go point. ahead, inject yourself. Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. If it kills you, you got your answer. If it makes you sick, you got your answer. If yeah. it turns you into something else, you got your answer. Right. If you get COVID, which interestingly, Nobody's ever seen. They've seen the diagnosis. They've seen a lot of talk on television. Yeah. Have you seen that virus? No, I haven't. No one's seen it. And that's the mastery of manipulation, mm -hmm. right? If, if you see, if you go into the post office and you see the face of criminals and it says wanted, and then you run into them in the grocery store, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Then you say, ah, you look just like that person. And interesting, you look like you got a gun stuck in the back of your belt. <laughs> uh, I think I'm better go tell somebody about this, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm really saying, and so everyone's clear on my position on COVID and the lockdown and the Great Reset, whatever choice you make, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And you have to decide what freedom is to you. Mm -hmm. You have to decide what it means to be a citizen in a democracy. You mm -hmm. have to decide what a constitution is for and why the founding fathers put the things they did in the constitution because of all the shit they seen happen to people, <laughs> right? Yeah. So my position on COVID and on the Great Reset is it is what it is and whatever you choose will be your responsibility. Mm. Personally, if I have to pack my family up and find a remote island on some tiny little place in the world and build a lean-to made of trees so they can't find me with their overhead scanners and cover myself in mud or dig a fucking hole into a cave, that's far less stressful to me than being a guinea pig in somebody else's fucking experiment because... I have studied this stuff extensively, and I could tell you, oh, uh, I could talk for 20 hours without ever needing to stop of all the <laughs> kinds of you. shit that's been going on yeah. on this planet. All you got to do if you want to see evidence of this and how long this crap is, get Richard Wilhelm's version of the Tao Te Ching. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's like Go really into famous. the back of that book after Lao Tzu's 81 verses of poetry. Yeah. And read Richard Wilhelm's story of being in China for 30-something years and talking to the spiritual masters who trained him so he could even interpret the Tao Te Ching and find out what he says about the history of the emperors of China bringing the most elite, well-respected spiritual leaders in to be interrogated so they can then customize those teachings to get everybody to conform so that the people think they're practicing religion, but they're actually being governed by the emperor. That's in the back of yes. Wilhelm's translation. Yes. Wow, that's such a famous translation. Oh, yes. That's in the back of it? Yeah, but most people don't read books. They just read the parts <laughs> they want. Yeah, well, I mean, I've read <clears throat> that Wilhelm's translation, so I've, I've never even gotten that far. Well... I'm here to help you. <laughs> Thank you. And the list goes on and on and on. The history of religions manipulating the greatest spiritual teachers' For sure. messages. Mm -hmm. well, we just talked about 32,000 versions of Christianity. Yeah. And this is why Deepak Chopra wrote the book, The Third Jesus, mm. which I thought was impressive because what was he saying? Okay, if you really want to practice the teachings of Jesus, here they are. It is the most radical path you will ever follow. Mm. He was the wildest, most intense of probably most of the mystics right up there with Rumi. Mm. So if you want to practice Christianity, this is what it looks like. 
Hmm. And I'd love to see it. Yeah. We would all love to see it. Absolutely. I can't remember who said it. Like, it's not that Christianity failed. It's just never been tried. That's exactly (laughs) right. Yeah. No, I'm not. I don't want to discredit the people that are living true sure. christianity desert fathers and mothers there's yeah. a lot of great mystics for sure yeah i mean we've got you know saint hildegard of bingen who's mm-hmm. mind-blowing you got uh saint bernard you've got uh even just thomas merton you mentioned thomas earlier. merton you got father thomas keating you got uh meister eckhart i mean there you know i've got a library with lots of christian mystics mm-hmm. in it who almost all almost got killed for mm-hmm. being who they were. Yeah, on the edge of the inside, those guys. I, I would rather die in alignment with my faith than bowing down to some imaginary force. And when you can't discern video from reality, you're in deep, deep shit. For sure. You mentioned something earlier and I waited to, I didn't answer it. You were asking the question, what is reality? Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. You want the answer? I've always wanted the answer. Reality is what's happening right now. Hmm. This is reality. Me and you, mm-hmm. right? Here we are. Me and you having a great conversation, breathing fresh air on top of a mountain. Hmm. Why? Because I worked my fucking balls off to get here. <laughs> no one handed me a fucking thing. That's reality. Hmm. Reality is when you go home tonight and your wife kisses you and you know she's there. And that's love. That's reality. Reality is also knowing when you're being lied to. Reality is also knowing when someone's pulling the fucking wool over your eyes. Reality is also learning to ask bigger questions. And reality is asking, are the people telling me how to be healthy? Healthy! (laughs) Yeah. Very good point. Right? Yeah. I always say, don't take health education from people that can't teach naked (laughs) okay right i tell all my students if you can't teach in your underwear then you're doing something wrong (laughs) now the caveat would be is if you used to weigh 300 pounds and now you weigh 200 but you're still overweight you can stand happily in your underwear and say guess what if i look overweight now you should have seen me a year ago so if you're heavier than me i can show you how to get to where i'm at (laughs) From there, we can go together as a team. Mm. Reality is what's happening right now. Mm. That's what reality is. And and the trick is, are you perceiving what's happening or has the magician tricked you? And right now, we got a lot of sleight of hand going on. For sure. And uh, I know some very intelligent people. I mean, how can you not listen to a triple board-certified medical, board certified medical doctor named Zach Bush, who oh, clearly God, I love Zach points Bush. right to what we're doing to the environment, what we've been doing to the environment. All you got to do is study the life of Nikola Tesla and look at his um, challenges with J.P. Morgan, who stood to lose billions if not trillions of dollars in sales for copper for wires for telephone systems and electrical systems and all that if tesla actually brought his inventions to market and wiped tesla out Hmm. to get rid of them look into the research showing that tesla's secrets were captured by the united states government and kept under lock and key because the cost of not having us paying for electricity and all these other gadgets, which Tesla was trying to make free to all of us, they stood to lose trillions of dollars. So what do you do? What do we need right now? We need to quit burning fossil fuels absolutely freaking right now. And we have the technology. We had it. Tesla invented these technologies around 1901. Hmm. And others have too. And many of them have disappeared off the face of the earth for getting patents on this and then not selling it to people that wanted to bury it. Mm. Many doctors have been disappeared off the face of the planet for coming up with cures for cancer. I mean, what I'm sharing is if you actually start looking into the medical field, into the energy field, into the military industrial complex, you see the devil everywhere. Absolutely. And what is that all for? Because without those polarities, you can't be conscious. 
Mm-hmm. You can't be conscious without positive and negative, light and dark, good and evil. Those are the that's the menu, mm-hmm. right? Without it, there's nothing to be conscious of. You get the point? Yeah. A, if your heartbeat doesn't go up and down, you're dead. Sure. And breathing <laughs> in and out. If you don't breathe bit. in and out, you're dead. Mm-hmm. Right? So the point I'm making is all the things that are in the world are God's willingness to try everything to experience the truth of itself. Mm-hmm. There's as much God as in in um Fauci or any of these guys as there isn't any of us because God's saying yes. The question is, which church do we want to be a member of? Mm-hmm. Right? Which which party do we want to sign our name to? Mm-hmm. Which which um petition do we want to sign? I'm I'm not saying we should be violent about this. I'm simply saying we need to say we won't support corporations that are destroying the planet. We won't support unethical, immoral corporations that are not doing science due diligence. I feel I feel terribly sad for all the scientists that are real scientists in the world because they're watching the world use bogus science to justify illusions. Mm. For a real scientist, that's got to be like Jesus watching 32,000 branches of Christianity be <laughs> completely confused in his name. Mm. This is a uh, this is a time where we all have a choice to really decide are we ready to just be honest and loving and supporting of each other and create an environment for all of us to grow and live our dreams out together or do we want to be locked in an invisible jail and become guinea pigs to people that turn us into profit centers like pigs in a corporate farm getting fed soylent fucking green through a slide in tray and become acclimatized to the fact that our wings have been clipped, our teeth are not sharp and we've got no future anymore Mm -hmm. because the only way out of that is to die. Totally. And depending on your philosophy, you might be coming back to the world that you left behind. So, well, especially if if you didn't participate in (laughs) it, right? Yeah. You know, that's another long discussion, but (laughs) you know, I think it's, look, we go ride roller coasters because the fear keeps us alive. We watch scary movies because it excites us. Mm -hmm. Jung said, no man is fully alive until he has the power to destroy himself. And here we all are. Mm -hmm. We got enough nuclear weapons armed to destroy the planet 179 times over. We've got manufactured viruses somehow mysteriously sneaking out of labs used to make biological weapons to kill other people Mm -hmm. that don't agree with our philosophy or won't let us steal their resources. Oh, welcome to the party. We've got a military that's supposed to be protecting us, but it's not. It's being used against us. We've got spy systems that we developed to protect us, but now they're being used against us. Okay, well, how passive can you get? I mean, how, how when do you finally say enough of this horse shit? It's time for us to stand up and let our voices be heard and simply, look, the Italians got rid of their government because they had enough of that horse shit and they ousted, ousted the government. There's, as many people have said, there's only a few of them and there's a lot of us. The thing is, we've got to get in harmony and decide what really matters first. Mm-hmm. I mean, how much genius does it take? To look at the American medical system, which is the most expensive medical system in the world and ranks 37th for effectiveness, before you just say, wait a minute, why do we keep pumping money into something that's very dysfunctional? Mm -hmm. Why do we keep spending money to get to another planet when that same money could be used to heal our planet? Why do we have a military budget that's something like, I don't even remember the numbers, our military budget is bigger than like... (laughs) Two thirds of the freaking world's yeah, it's military. Like trillions a day to the Pentagon or something. Yeah, like that. it's it's, it's just like, crazy. are you kidding me? Yeah. Why don't we invest that in peace? Mm-hmm. Why don't we invest that in education? Yeah, back to the soil and the clean water and what? all that we just mentioned. Why don't we task the military with doing something like fighting a real enemy, like pollution and corporate mm-hmm. injustice? Oh, that would be amazing. Right? We, we have all these abilities, but this is what happens when you're caught on the hind tit playing with your fucking iPhone and. Uh, watching porno and hoping God's not watching. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Shit. 
Got some individuation to do here. Some we have some in individuation to do. And the initiation do. has begun. Yeah. So, you know, I look at all this and, and I say, well, look what we've called upon ourselves. We've, yeah. you know, set the we, table here. We've unconsciously we? called forth a trial mm -hmm. of adulthood. Yeah. And the good news is nobody's threatening nuclear war. They're just threatening <laughs> nuclear injections. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Exactly. We'll do this one person at a time. Yeah. And once you start looking into some of the technology behind all this shit and seeing what the long range plan is, it gets even scarier. I won't even go into that. But it's just like, holy shit, man. The, these, there's a few people in the world that have out of control power drives really dangerously out of control hmm. i mean everyone listening if you have not read the book oneness versus the one percent by von donna shiva hmm. drop the fucking phone <laughs> get off this podcast go order it immediately and study it like your fucking life depends on it hmm. because it will tell you more about what bill gates is truly up to what his agendas is and how he made over a trillion dollars last year largely manipulating markets and ripping people off hmm. dot dot what he's done to india how many people he's killed in african india with his non-tested vaccinations and von donna shiva is nobody to mess with she is one of the wisest, most well put together women on this fucking planet. And when she sees the devil, she calls the devil out. <laughs> and and, and I've even heard of it. Wow. Oh, wow. Oneness versus the 1%. It mm. is a ball busting, eye opening expose of what the global elite really think. They think this world is a marketplace to be. Plucked. They think that they can just do whatever the hell they want to do. And I won't even go into some of the things that are in that <laughs> book because it'll just shock the piss out of people. <laughs> but it's real yeah. and it's hmm. researchable. Hmm. So, well, Ryan. Paul. How would you like to conclude our amazing journey together? What is your... What is your heartfelt message for the world? If you were going to leave this planet tomorrow <laughs> and you said, okay, I've just got an opportunity to be on international television and give a parting message, what would it be? I think it'd be pretty simple. You know, I have these little, uh, well, I have a lot of tattoos, but the ones on my hands came to me as just a simple um, distillation of my life philosophy as a result of when I had Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2017. And after having lost, I guess, the worldview that gave me a bearing in the world and any sense of certitude, I just knew by facing my own death and at that point, not really knowing, you know, what, what the turnout would be, whether I would I thought I'd be fine at the end of this, but I didn't know for sure. And so yeah. I had to sort of face like, well, what if I died? It really clarified for me what mattered to me. And I realized that, you know, if I were to die because of this cancer, I would want to spend my end, the end of my days expressing my love to yeah. the people in my life. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that you know, I'm, I'm never going to have all the answers and I'm not going to control all the outcomes, but uh, I know that in the end, betrayal and loss and bitterness and, you know, all of those things, they're just not going to matter. They'll burn away like chaff. Yeah. And what will really matter and what will last is the love that I invested into the world and into the people in my life. And, and so it really distilled to the simple phrase, it's not really very creative. It's just life is a gift mm -hmm. and love is the point. And yeah. Those two phrases really encapsulate for me. Like when people say, well, what do you believe now? You know, and, well, I don't know if it's very much. It's not like the longest list in the world, but but uh, the convictions of life as a gift lead me to an, a posture of gratitude in the world mm -hmm. to walk out in, into the every new day and breathe deep and be like, thank you. Thank you for this gift. And yeah. then love is the point drives me to live a life uh, of loving and serving, you know? Yeah. So if I can get down to, you know, there's a lot of things we can invest ourselves in and a lot of problems obviously to address in our world. And 
But at the end of the day, if I miss those two things, if I miss the the joy of looking into my kids' eyes, of you know, slow dancing with my wife in the kitchen, and mm. just being, as you said, reality is here. Yeah, now, yeah. Then, then I've missed it. You know, everything else is uh, is can be beautiful and and beneficial, but they're details. If I miss gratitude for life and love as the center point. Yeah, well, that's lovely. I have one last question for you. Yeah, don't worry, it's not so deep. <laughs> um, you surprised me earlier because yeah. even though we've interacted through email and and have common uh, connections together, I didn't know that you'd had cancer, and yeah. I certainly didn't know that there was a book that you said helped you out very much. Yeah, and you had me sign it today. Yeah, I sure did. Eat, move, and be healthy by my friend Paul Jack. So the reason I'm bringing <laughs> that up is because here's my question. Yeah. What is it, if you had to put it in a nutshell, that I teach in that book that helped you get over cancer? Yeah, well, if I had to put it in a nutshell, there's so much good stuff in there. I use it like a reference book all the time. I would just, I just went back to functional movements the other day, just uh, the, the stretching exercises to check in, where am I tight? But yeah. if I were to like be succinct about what really clicked for me was... Um, changing my relationship to my body like mm. almost like it was a like someone that i loved yeah like good externalizing idea. this right yeah I, I think you said something earlier about how your your first relationship is to yourself yeah. like the first world that the soul inhabits yes. is the body in yeah. a sense i don't mm -hmm. know if i'm butchering that but no it's pretty fairly accurate at least in this dimension yeah so i just had never it never even occurred to me. To me, it was like, uh, you know how some people treat rental cars? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. That's how I was treating my body my whole life. Like, yeah. I just, I got to use it to get from A to B. And yeah. for the first time in my life, I realized, like, I could love myself enough to be like, hey, I need to rest. And mm -hmm. I can check in mm -hmm. on my own body and be like, hey, how am I, you know, how am I taking care of this temple? You yes. know, to use that language. Yeah. And it completely flipped the way I oriented around my body. I started to actually listen mm. to my body, which is a foreign concept, like yeah. checking in in the morning. How do I feel? What does my body need? That that whole thing was just a... What's my poop telling me? Yeah, What's exactly. What's my look like and smell yeah, like? How absolutely. am I breathing? Yeah. Right. Can I even move my head this direction? Like those things never even occurred Am to I me. eating real food? Mm -hmm. Oh, the amount of things that I was putting in my body. That book was... I mean, it was like page after page of, oh my gosh, that's what I'm putting in my body. That's what I'm, yeah. and so the awareness just went way up for me. Yeah. So the reason I asked that is not to toot my own horn. <laughs> it was a way of saying, I have spent my life studying the fundamentals. Yeah. And what that book teaches you is that whatever you do to the world outside of you, you do to the world Absolutely. inside of oh, you. Oh, yeah. And so because of the conversation we've just had, I wanted to conclude it by yeah. those of you, if you think I'm a crazy, wild, <laughs> whatever, know that I devoted my life to studying what matters mm -hmm. to support life. Yep. And what matters to support life is that you must realize that you are a part of nature and whatever you do to nature, you do to yourself. And whatever you do to yourself, you're doing to nature. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. As above, so below, as below, so above, the ancient alchemical dictum. And why I'm saying this and why I asked you that question is because of this whole issue we're going through in the world right now, we have got to be conscious of what we're doing to ourselves mm -hmm. and why we keep having to run to a medical profession that's failing for help, largely because we're not paying attention to what we're doing to ourselves and they're not invested in telling you the truth because mm -hmm. they won't make any money off of you. Mm -hmm. I haven't missed a day of work due to illness in 37 years. Not one. <laughs> wow. Why? Cool. Because I practice what I teach. Yeah. So uh, this whole bug in the air doesn't scare me at all. It's like, okay, if I get it, my immune system will make antibodies. I'll knock the shit out of it and it'll be all cool, man. That's mm -hmm. what an immune system's for. But at the same time, let me make sure I keep it healthy. Mm -hmm. Or it's like drugging your own soldiers and figuring out why you can't win the war. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the foundation of what it is that keeps us healthy together mm -hmm. is keeping the planet healthy and keeping ourselves healthy. And if you have a sick body, you can't have a healthy mind. Amen. Right?
Absolutely. And yeah. we've got a lot of sick bodies with a lot of tired, flaccid minds mm-hmm. that are not aware that the same tricksters that haven't been telling them how to eat or what they're doing to destroy the planet aren't telling them the truth right now. Yep. But there are wise people out there, such as Bruce Lipton, yep. uh, Zach Bush. Uh, what's the Rashid, Rashid bah- Batar? I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Batar. Uh, he's been on London Real several times. Brian Rose has brought lots. There's many podcasts. There's uh, the lady that was in the Plandemic movie that that they basically ruined her career. I forgot the name. She was a, a virologist, an expert mm. at this. Uh, I mean, the list is long. Mm. I mean, there's so much great information out there, but they keep taking it off. Mm. And as Leslie Manukian uh, said in my podcast, and she's researched this extensively, I said, um, she said, well, they keep covering up the truth. And I said to her, how do you know that it's the truth? She said, because they take it down. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that's a very good point. <laughs> so you look at who's being silenced, right? Mm-hmm. Facebook's threatening to silence JP Sears because what's he doing? He's doing his job as a jester. Hmm. He's saying, wake up. It's funny, but it's not funny. Wake up. Hmm. Pay attention, right? So uh, I, I'm asked you the question to point out that the book helped you heal from cancer because it helped you become aware of the fundamentals of what health is. Absolutely. And it makes it clear that what you eat, what you drink, and what you breathe is something that comes from the outside and it either poisons you or it helps keep you healthy. Mm-hmm. And so we've got to be careful about what we bring into our minds, what we believe, what we bring into our bodies and the choices we make, and we've certainly got to take care of our kids because, boy, are they being targeted right now mm-hmm. by many organizations and institutions from the medical system to the political system to the drug system. It, it, it's just like our kids. I mean, look at what's happened to children and their education since the beginning of this thing. Oh, I mean, yeah. the, kids, the kids have been hit the hardest. Oh, yeah. Well, we've been defunding the public school system for so many years. Yeah. Like decades, really. Right. So. I mean, imagine when you're like nine getting locked into a house all day. Ugh, I would right. have just, I probably would have just turned inside out. I yeah. don't know. Oh, I, my parents were saying the other day they hung out with a family, I think, and one of the kids was crying and the parents were saying, the I had, the baby had been born during COVID and they were saying, yeah, this, she's never seen this many people before. Like wow. it was the first time a big group of people have been around and that the sociological impact of this long term is ra- rarely talked about. Like what the, what it takes to keep trust in a community yeah. is connection. Yeah. And so like, it's going to be for us to come together and start to, you know, come across these divides and work together to say, hey, do we still want these people in charge of our lives? Yeah. Is going to require trust. Yes. But trust is eroding when we don't see each other's faces. We yeah. can't get together. No. Like, so sociologically is a whole nother, you know, element to this. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, it's a very interesting situation because here's a question for you. Hmm. In order to pull this off worldwide, Th- this being what? The whole pandemic and reset okay. organization. Yeah. Okay. My question for you is, how long would you have to plan an event that big? Me? <laughs> no, anybody. <laughs> I don't know. Probably a long time. Many, many years. Yeah. And how many people would have to be involved? Every government. Hmm. Why am I saying this? Ladies and gentlemen, you've been lied to and duped for a very long time hmm. because a strategy that's global like this takes thousands of people to orchestrate, many of which are your public figures and politicians and governors and presidents Mm -hmm. and military heads, because if the military was really doing their job, they would be going after who's ever behind this horse shit right away. Mm -hmm. And so whoever's behind this has pulled a smoke screen on us and it's been going on for a long time and that should make you concerned (laughs) (laughs) well one thing's for sure i do not believe everything the government tells me and i'm definitely not in that group of people who thinks the government has your best interest in heart i can't even understand people who think that no (laughs) hey we've had a great run 
what a yeah. great time. You guys. And a great day. Man, yeah, I've had such a good day. Totally with fun, man. <laughs> great food, great smoke, great water, uh, great exercise, great company, yeah. and uh, great conversation. And I will close by saying, look, I'm not asking anybody to conform to my opinion. I'm not trying to be forceful. I'm just using freedom of speech to say, <laughs> look, I've spent 60 years on this planet studying hard, participating hard. I've been inside the bowels of the whale, the devil, and everything else. I've been inside the military. I've seen what it looks like from the inside out. I've worked in the medical establishment for a long time. I'm sharing my observations, and I'm saying the answer is yes. <laughs> and your mind is a very powerful tool that's a far better servant than a master. Mm. And be careful when someone else is trying to take your mind over and be your master. It doesn't matter if it's a church or a, a corporate establishment or anything. Once you lose control of your mind, there's not a lot of future for you. I believe that. So my key message is take responsibility for the power of your mind. Mm -hmm. Use it constructively. And when in doubt, seek wise people that have more life experience specifically in those areas that are reliable mm. and even if they're very convincing keep finding more until the consensus is enough that whatever decision you make you're willing to die for mm. and that's called being an adult <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that <laughs> and thank you to all of our sponsors at living 4d with paul check they have amazing products very high values and standards they're all practicing sustainable business practices and anytime you buy from them i have to thank you because a little commission goes to me to help run the podcast pay the podcast team and give me some time in my schedule to find amazing people like ryan to talk to and do research and try to give you a great product that's a nice combination of education and entertainment and so I love all of you and I love all the sponsors. And if I've upset you today, know that it's not because I've tried to upset you. It's because sometimes that's how love works. So <laughs> lots of love, everyone. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Ryan Meeks. You can find Ryan on Instagram at Ryan T. Meeks or on his website, www.loveisthepoint. Dot com. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check or Twitter at paulcheck or on his YouTube podcast channel youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site chikiva.com.